Lord, even now, I just feel just the holy, holy presence. Lord, I ask that you would transform our lives tonight. Lord, I know that there's been so much that's been spoken over us in the last 48 hours. But Lord, we ask that you would now put it deep within our heart. Lord, let it not lodge in our brain, but Lord, let it seep 12 inches down into our heart, Lord. Lord, make this thing become a reality in our life. Help us, Lord. Anoint us, Lord, to live this thing out, to flesh this thing out, Lord, in our communities, in our place of influence, in our businesses, Lord. Father, I ask for your richest anointing and blessing tonight upon every testimony, every word that's spoken upon the worship, Lord. May the glory of the Lord fill this house, and may you transform our lives by your Spirit. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Give them a hand clap of praise. <laughs> praise the Lord. You may be seated. And at this time, my friend Ward Simpson is going to come. And we're going to have open up with a couple of testimonies real quick this morning, this evening. Praise the Lord. Are you happy tonight? You should be. Has anybody got any rest? Did y'all have a sleep? Well, good. Congratulations. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I was about to say, do you have a testimony? And a young lady put her hand up before I even asked. Was that what you were doing? I'll get to you in a minute. But it better be good. In 90 seconds. All right. <laughs> I want to call on um, one of our... Actually, he is the chairman or the vice chairman of the board of this church here. Where is Brother Carl gone to? Where are you at, Carl? There you are. Carl, you better come this way because everybody can't see you. This is retired Captain Carl Seitler of the U.S. Navy. Good to have you here, brother. I want you to share with the, uh, with the audience here tonight what God's doing in your life and, and this anointed for business subject, what it means to you. Okay. Well, Ward, it's been a blessing. I've certainly enjoyed this conference. And yes, I retired from the Navy in November of 1990. And I'm still employed. I'm not a business owner, but I'm in the marketplace as a business person, as a manager for the Department of Navy at the Air Station. And by virtue of serving some 27 years in the military and having the privilege of, of being in some high-level management positions, here locally, uh, some of these positions, just by virtue of being there, uh, brought about a certain amount of respect from the people that you, you dealt with. But I've always had the mindset that I had rather people respect me because of the principles I, principles I live by and do business by than respect me because of a position that I'm in. And when you operate that way, it's incredible what God will do in terms of opening up doors that people will come to you and ask your advice on things. And I've had incredible opportunities to speak into their lives. And I've tried to, in, in my marketplace, uh, I've always tried to be straightforward, honest, a person of integrity, and treat people fairly and impartially. Because when you do that, uh, again, the Lord just opened up doors for you to speak to people. And those things are just important, honesty, integrity, uh, whether you're on the first rung of the ladder, the corporate ladder, or the top. In fact, they get even more important as you go up because your sphere of influence increases. So those things are even more important. But I'd just like to share a couple of things. Uh, there's certainly opportunities to speak to people and deal with people and represent the King of King and Lord and Lords, Lord of Lords. But there's also things in our marketplace that really we have the opportunity uh, to bring about some change. And I think about back to the Enron situation and other corporations. And more recently, a company that we do business with, uh, EDS, has, has also um, are being looked back at by the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission because of how they reported earnings. And 
again, uh, we need we need men and women of integrity yes. in the corporate and the marketplace because of these things are happening. And a, an example that will bring something more closer to home is something that I shared with this congregation before the last general election, and that and that had to do with. Uh, there was a lot of business uh, amendments on the Florida ballot the last general election. And we were here, I was speaking to the congregation about the importance of voting. And, and because of there's so many business amendments on that ballot. And I used the example and compared the salary of a Major League Baseball player with, a, with our school teachers here in Escambia County. And baseball then had a minimum wage of like 250,000 a year, and what this was this was for players that, for the most part, in baseball vernacular, they rode the pine. These are people that you never saw, unless one of the first line players something happened, and then they're they're caught in the service. But if you break that down to a monthly salary, it's like $21,000 a month. Our school teachers here in Scambia County, two years ago. That was the annual salary of teachers in this county. And I submit to you, look at what these people do. And when one's making $700 a day, and teachers that we entrust our kids with are making $58 a day, I would say there's a lot of opportunities in the marketplace for change. Amen. 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 How many of you here tonight have loved ones or friends or family in the in the uh, in the Gulf War? Just show your hands. You know this probably is a good opportunity to pray for our troops. Would you do that for us? Yes. 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 Thank you, Father. We just love you, and Lord, we love our men and women in uniform that are serving today. Lord, they're paying a price. They're paying a price for our freedom, our liberty, and Lord, we don't take that for granted. And even now, Lord, we pray for our commander-in-chief, we pray for our military leaders, and we pray for those that are on the battlefield this very moment, Lord. Yes. May you protect them, Lord. Yes, yes. Lord, bring a quick resolution to this thing. Yes, Lord. Lord, we pray for the freedom and the liberty of that country, Lord. Yes, Lord. And Lord, you are our provider. We come to you for all our needs, and we just cast this need upon you now. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Give God praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the things we've tried to be careful of with this conference is uh, we don't want to. There were people asking if we could exchange names and have a, a, a kind of a network going. And we were very, very, we want to be very private with everybody's here. So we said, no, we can't do that. And uh, there may have been one or two people that have been uh, giving stuff out. And if you've received it, that's fine. But it's just not part of the conference, so we hope that everything has been okay. I think there was one uh, lady giving her resume out at the uh, back of the... <laughs> that was pretty smart, but it wasn't from us. So. <laughs> she must have given out 300 resumes today. <laughs> so, Lord help her. But um, just so you know, like I made it... How many of y'all enjoyed Barry Hahn? Did you hear Barry Hahn yesterday? <laughs> Wasn't he great? Well, you know, whatever he, whatever he was talking, I was recording all these scenes. I'll have to try and remember. Like, you know, whenever $17 million was a lot of money. I'll have to remember that one. So anyway, today somebody asked me for my business card. And I said, well, you know, when I was poor, I used to give out business cards. But <laughs> that's a pretty good line, I thought. <laughs> I still have them, but I didn't give him one. <laughs> well, listen, there's a friend of ours here today. Where's Brother Jim Irby? Jim, oh, there you are. Let me come to see you. Sometimes if you hear the word spirit-filled, born again, Jesus worshiping used car dealer. It sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? But in actual fact, right here in Pensacola, we have a man of God, discount auto brokers, Jim Irby. Would you greet our, our, our audience tonight? Thank you. Thank you, Ward. This has been a great blessing just to be at this seminar, this conference. It's been awesome. Uh, a few years ago, the Lord led me to start a used car business, and people in my church thought, Are you sure you heard from God? And I said, uh, I really, really think I have. And uh, so I started a business that I knew nothing about, which I wouldn't advise to anybody unless you really have heard from God. 
And then you need to pray a lot and make sure you heard you got it. Because I thought for a while maybe I didn't. It is a difficult business, and it's unbelievably um, got a bad reputation. Yeah. Does anybody in here bought a car in the last few years and had a good experience? <laughs> right. About three or four, maybe a half a dozen. That's good. Uh, I tell people the, the, car rep, the car industry has a bad reputation, but if people knew what I know now, it would be even worse. It, it, is, it has got a lot of people in it that are really dishonest, and uh, unfortunately, um, it doesn't have to be that way. I have a friend of mine told me, he said, it's hard to be a Christian and be in the car business. I said, no, it's not. It's not any more difficult than it is to be a doctor, a lawyer, Indian chief, whatever. Anything you do. If you're going to do it to honor the Lord, you do it with integrity and honesty, and you treat people fair and honest. It's that simple. Either you have integrity or, integrity or you don't. And the car industry needs more godly people with integrity in it, as well as we need more godly lawyers like we heard from today. And uh, it's been an incredible blessing. I've, I've enjoyed the business. He's not sure if he's godly or not. <laughs> He is, believe me. Um, but it has been a real blessing. We've been able to to support a lot of ministries. We've been able to increase our finances. It's a, it's a mom and pop business. It's nothing big. But we do have. Um, we've been able to give a lot of cars away to people as God directed. And it's just the Bible is true. It is more blessed to give than receive. And if you really believe Malachi three, you can't out give God. Amen. And if you, if you want to build a business, build it on giving, and God will bless it. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Jim. God bless you. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Now, the chairman of our board took a few minutes, but he's the chairman. He can get away with it. You're a young lady, so we'll give you grace, too. Your name and where you're from. I'm Monica from Detroit, one of the two people or three people here from Detroit. And I'm just excited because I tried to take to heart what Tamara said about witnessing yesterday. And this morning I wrote a note in my hotel room to the person cleaning my room and I wrote, I would like to talk to you about Jesus. Please leave me a note if you're interested. And to get her attention I left a $5 tip. When I got back to my room this evening, there was a note that said, I am interested, I'll call you later tonight. Wonderful. Well, stand up, Sonny. Brother Sonny here, he's in charge of our pastoral care department at the school. So if you have uh, students in our school, and I know what was running through his mind, if he got a note like that, leaving $5 if you're interested, he'd write back and say, for 10, I'll be interested. Yeah? <laughs> Greet everybody, sir. Uh, boy, what a blessing this this uh, conference has been. Things been spoken here that I've been that I've been saying in my heart for a long time. I, I ran a I ran a business, a Christian business, a ministry related business for 20 years, and it supported my ministry actually about 95 percent. And uh, this is exciting what we're hearing in this conference. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Well, we're about to hear from uh, Tamara Lowe. You want to hear from Tamara tonight? Come on. Just before we do that, you know, I'm going to have time for one more testimony. We were on TV the other night promoting this conference, and it just happened. We didn't plan it. It happened. We had a real estate agent, a banker, an insurance agent. Who else do we have, Steve? A landscaper and an auto automobile repair center. So if you were watching that night, you could have bought a house had it financed, had it landscaped, and if your car was giving trouble, we'd fix it. And then, most of all, you could get your insurance. Mike, God bless you. Stand up and greet this crowd, brother. Thank you. Your name and what's your name? Uh, Mike Hill, and um, uh, I got just a quick word for you, but this is strong. This is strong. Um, when the Lord gave Moses instructions on how to build the ark, it was explicit. And the Bible tells us when it was finished, the glory of the Lord dwelt in the ark. It was a Shekinah glory. It was visible. You could see it. Okay, now let's go a little bit further up in history. David passed on to Solomon explicit instructions on how to build the temple. Solomon followed those instructions, and these words are there. It says, when it was finished, the glory of the Lord dwelt there in that temple. 
Now, anything that's taken place in the Old Testament for it to apply to Christians today has to go through the cross. Here's Jesus on the cross. He followed explicit instructions from his father. And when he was on that cross, when he said, it is finished, boom, immediately around the world, instantaneously, man's heart was turned from stone to flesh and the Holy Spirit came to dwell in us. Now, wherever the ark went, the blessings followed. The blessings followed wherever the ark went. I'm almost there. <laughs> so here's, here's David, a man after God's own heart. He says, we got to go get the ark, you guys. They went and got the ark, and they were bringing it back. As they were bringing it back, oxen stumbled, a man touched it, boom, died. They're standing there looking at it. David says, you get it. I'm not going to touch it. No, you tell I'm not going to touch it. And they left it there with a Hittite, Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom prospered. Why? Because he was there with the ark. The spirit of God was there. The blessings followed it. Okay? David heard about Obed-Edom's blessing. He said, we got to go get the ark, you guys. That's good, Richard. He went to go get it. Yes. This time, he says, we're going to do it right. And it says, every six steps, he made an offering to God. Wow. Imagine that kind of worship. No wonder by the time he got to Jerusalem, he was dancing like he was crazy. Amen. Oh. He was there, you know? Yeah. Okay, so let's bring it back through the cross again. Right, Take it back through the cross. Jesus said it's finished. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. Wherever you go, the blessings go. Wherever you go, the blessings go. When you walk into a room, it is blessed. Why? Because you're there. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's in you. Okay? So when you go out with your business or you go into a business or you're working in a business, keep in mind that wherever you go, you are blessed, and you are there to spread the blessings. So change your prayer from, oh, Lord, bless me, the blessings in you, to, Lord, how do I use this blessing in me to get out to others? Amen. As a brother said here, you give. You give. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up and thank God for that blessing. Come on. Let's give God praise all over here. Come on, Jesus. We give you praise, oh, Lord, for the blessing that follows. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord! Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Now let's give Tamara Law a big, raving, roving applause. Come on! Come on! Thank you. You guys are very kind. Please take your seats. Thank you so much. I, I want to say, um, just really, it's been such a blessing for me to be in this conference. Hasn't BRSM done a great job with this conference? Oh, come on, you guys. You know you never heard anything this good in your life. <laughs> I, honestly, you know, when, when Ward told me that, that he was going to have two attorneys on the program, you know, I had this flashback to a couple of years ago, I was asked to speak at a conference, um, a, a Christian conference in Canada, and somebody made the decision that they should have three, not one, not two, but three psychiatrists speak on depression. Not freedom from depression, just depression. <laughs> You know, and I had to follow all three of them. And I mean, by the time it was over, I was depressed. You know, I mean, the lady next to me offered me a Tic Tac and I was like, honey, keep your Tic Tac. You got any Prozac? You know, I mean, I, uh, but I mean, you guys were awesome. Larry Morris, I mean, give it up for him. Isn't he good? We really appreciated the word. All of the speakers have been so awesome. Rich Marshall, um, you guys, who has not read God at Work? Show me your hands. 
Okay, listen to me. I've recommended it to so many people. It's Destiny Image Publishing. I know who published it, okay? Uh, go out, just order a dozen of them. Save yourself some shipping costs from Amazon.com because you're going to give them away to everybody just like I did. I'm telling you what, I'm not going to recommend something to you that, that didn't really impact me. That book really, really impacted me. Um, I'm, yeah, in the bookstore. Hey, forget Amazon. We got them now, right now, right here, right now. <laughs> um, you know, a, a lot has been said about, um, you know, just to minister to the business people about how you are called in the marketplace. You know, you do not have to be, uh, you know, ordained minister to be in the ministry. Um, I want to just tell you something. Preaching is not a spiritual gift. It's not a spiritual gift. Any fool can preach, and a lot of them do. You know? It's true. But I want to encourage you. Spiritual gifts are for all believers, right? For all Holy Spirit-filled believers. <laughs> and I want to encourage you to use your spiritual gifts in the marketplace, right? You know, um, um, I, know I know that I have, have two spiritual gifts. One is in the realm of prophecy, and the other is discerning of spirits. And when I began to exercise these spiritual gifts in our office, I mean, it, it, totally, it totally transformed everything. Um, you know, <laughs> this is Rich Marshall, I got to tell you, this is so funny. Um, Larry, when you were speaking and you were saying, you know, I said I'd never be a lawyer, and don't ever say never about anything because, you know, that's... You know, that's something that's going to happen. Rich Marshall says, I'll never be a millionaire. <laughs> well, there was, there was two things that I said that I, I didn't want anything to do with. And um, one of them was being an intercessor. First of all, it was just too long and too important of a title, too many syllables, you know? And then I saw like the intercessors in my church, they were always crying and they seemed happy about it, you know? I, I, I couldn't figure it out, you know? And then I remember the first time somebody said to me, God gave me a burden for this. I thought, oh dear Lord, please never give me one of those. That sounds awful. I never want a burden. <laughs> the other thing, the second thing was deliverance, you know, with having to do with demons and, you know, just, just the whole shrieking and body fluid and, you know, I just didn't want anything to do with that. I, a couple of years ago, um, we were asked to go to Argentina and to do a meeting in, in the deep south of Argentina. It's very hard to get to. We had to charter a plane and, and there were some churches that cooperated to do this meeting, but they had never had revival there. And um, man, it was one of the most awesome experiences of my life. I mean, God showed up and, and totally shocked all of us. I mean, I'm telling you what, the building shook. The building shook from the top to the bottom and there was a sound of a whirlwind. And I, I remember I was telling a friend of mine afterwards, I said, you know, it was like an earthquake. And she said, no. She said, an earthquake goes from the bottom to the top. This was from the top to the bottom. It was awesome. And at the altar times, I mean, there, it was concrete floors. You know how it is in, in, you know, undeveloped countries and so on. And, you know, we didn't have any catchers. We didn't know we needed any catchers, you know. But at the altar time, man, boom, 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 people are hitting the ground. From over on, on this side of the church, I hear this shrieking. And so I think, what in the world is that? So I start praying my way over there, you know. And I get over here, and this woman is, is manifesting demons. And, I mean, she was literally levitating. She was this far off the ground. She was absolutely levitating. I took one look at her. God is my witness. I looked at her, and I said, not my ministry. And I started praying my way away from her. <laughs> But you know, the Lord, the Lord has, has used my spiritual gifts and, and also the spiritual gifts of others. You know, I think one of the great keys to success in business is, is to find other people who complement your weaknesses, who help you, you know, where you're weak. And so, you know, if that's not necessarily your gifting, then you gather other people to you. But I asked my husband tonight for permission to share this testimony because I've never shared it publicly, and, and he gave me permission to share it with you. 
um, we went through, you know, people come to our seminars and they see these huge arenas and they see all these celebrities and, you know, they just think, you know, life is lovely in Lowville, you know, but they don't know the struggles that we've had. And we went through, I would say, four years of just really absolute hell, absolute hell, that, that every day was a, was a new overwhelming crisis. And I remember one day, about three years into it, my husband said to me, you need to really pray because we need $100,000 tomorrow, and I don't know where it's, where it's coming from. Now, have any of you ever been in that position? Maybe it wasn't $100,000. Maybe it was a million dollars tomorrow. Maybe it was $10,000 tomorrow. Have you been in that position? Okay. And I just looked at him and I said, Peter, how is this different from any day for the past three years? I said, I'm sorry, but I just can't work up any more anxiety over it. You know, I said, I can't. And I said, you know what? I am tired of praying desperation prayers. I just can't pray any more desperation prayers. I mean, if we're not going to pray in faith, I just can't agree with you. You know, I can't agree with anybody who's not going to pray prayers of faith anymore, you know? And I mean, we, we went through it. Um, one of the things that happened was that the devil began to sow witches and warlocks into our organization. We would come to work in the morning and there would be cassette tapes strung all the way around our offices. We would walk through our offices, we'd find dead frogs, we'd find feathers, you know, and they were, they were camouflaging themselves as Christians in our organization, in our Christian organization. And you know what we did? We took, we took a team, a small team of people, half a dozen people. I can't tell you the number of times I walked through those offices and anointed everything. I mean, everything was coated in oil. I mean, everything on everybody's desk. And God gave us discernment. I remember one time we walked into this office and one of, one of our intercessors started pointing to the computer wires and she was going, oh, there's something wrong with those computer wires. Well, it just so happened that the VP of IT was with us on that prayer Walk. The next day he goes and he checks out this guy's computer. He's visited over a thousand pornographic websites in the past month in our, in our Christian company. <laughs> you know, but God, God began to root out some of the wickedness, but that's why I'm telling you, you know, about that whole thing of fighting, you know, you have got to stand your ground. It's an absolute battle, but I want to give you a witness. Like when, when this whole thing, uh, sort of came to the hellish peak um, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Like financially, we were, our necks were in a noose. As far as the organization went, we had, we had a whole team of high level executives embezzling from us who stole proprietary information, went out to compete against us. And part of their business plan was to destroy our reputation. And so they went to the newspaper and the newspaper thought, oh, well, this is a great opportunity. So they printed one year ago, a year ago, they printed a front page article with my husband's picture real big and um, absolutely full of slander, full of lies, made him look like a complete crook, and they kept their journalistic integrity by putting everything in quotation marks. They just, they just took quotes from all, you know, these, this group of people who had banded together against us. Well, when everything was just kind of as bad as it could get, like the brother said, we decided to go on a world cruise, you know. No, we didn't do that. But what we did was we just said, man, you know, we're just going to we're just going to come clean. And so, we called all of our company together, over 100 employees. The witches were there, you know. And um we said, "Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to teach you about deliverance because some of you are so infested with demons you need to get free and so we're going to teach you about deliverance and so we did we taught him about deliverance and then we said anybody who wants to you sign up we're going to give you some prayer counseling i mean there and and i would say probably about 60 percent of the company signed up and went we had deliverance teams at our office and there was shrieking that scared the hell out of people and i i don't use that term lightly i mean the fear of god fell in that place and you know what happened we had revival we had revival. I am serious. We had a company meeting. And, I mean, there were, it, was, it was Brownsville, man. People were laid out all over the place. They were shaking. They were falling. Witches got saved. It was incredible. Hallelujah. It was incredible. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So 
you know what happened was um, we were working, we had actually sold our, our seminars to the, the people who owned Success Magazine, and our strategy was to move out more into missions and evangelism, and so it was their company, but we had a contract to, to run the company. And um, this doesn't happen, but I mean, the whole thing was going south. The magazine was going south, there, you know, it, and everybody wanted to hang it on Peter now, you see. And, um, ah. Uh, it was bad. It was so bad. And then this newspaper article hit, and the devil tried to put a mantle of shame on us, you know? And, um, and I, honestly, I have so much respect for my husband. He, you know, he amazed me. I, I told him, I said, Peter, I said, look, look what we have done for the kingdom, and look at the reward. And he, he rebuked me. He said, you got it all wrong. He said, you better snap out of this real quick. He said, you can cruise right through this, girl. You can cruise right through it. And so, you know, I said, you're right. You know, I gave into a spirit of self-pity for about five minutes, but I repent, you know. And he said, you know, this to me, he says, this newspaper article to me is a diploma. He says, I feel like I've graduated. I had so much respect for him. And, you know, they tried to, if they had said any, you know, it had no bearing with reality. You know, this guy is so pure, so straight, so clean. I remember one time I was in an airport and I got an uh, extra set of postage stamps from the vending machine. And I thought it was a blessing, you know? I put in 50 cents and I got out a dollar's worth of postage stamps, you know? And I said, honey, look, I got an extra set of postage stamps. And in my mind, I'm justifying it because I'm thinking about all the postage I've thrown out over the years that I never used. He goes, really, let me see that. I handed it to him, he ripped it up. I was like, what are you doing? He says, you can't use that. You didn't pay for that. I mean, the guy is so straight. He's so straight, you know? And they, and they made him look like a crook, you know? And I thought, now, if they had written something and made him look like the most impatient person on earth, I could handle that, because at least it has some bearing in reality, you know? He's not the most impatient person on earth. You know, he's a good man, but, you know, he, he has a low tolerance for stupidity. He just does, you know? He, does, he, he wants things fast. He wants... You know, bright people, sharp people around him. You know, I can't blame him. But um, here's the deal. One year later, it's one year later. In three days, we're going to do the largest seminar we've ever done in our lives. It's going to be um, altogether probably 50,000, 60,000 people, okay, in our hometown. In the hometown where they wrote the big nasty Sunday newspaper article. And listen to this. The mayor is giving him the key to the city. Giving my husband the key to the city. <laughs> praise God, praise God, praise God. Promotion, Lord. I, you know, I don't, I don't even really want to share this illustration with you, but I felt that the Lord told me to do it. So, um, we live in a beautiful house. We live in a beautiful house. But we have in our master bedroom a toilet that will not work unless I rebuke it. And you think I'm joking, but I am serious. If I do not rebuke the toilet, it does not flush. I mean, I got so mad about it about a month ago, I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. For five years, I've been rebuking this toilet. And you know what? All of a sudden, it occurred to me that there's a profound spiritual lesson in this, is that there is, there is some stuff in your life <laughs> that won't go down unless you rebuke it. <laughs> You know, I want to tell you something that, that really touched my life with, um, with Rich Marshall's book was that for the first time I felt affirmed about being in business because, you know, we operate in two realms. Um, I'm very comfortable in both realms. I wear both hats all the time at the same time, and that is that I, I am in the business world. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know this, and I don't really say it because I don't think it really assists us in our ministry, but my husband and I are ordained ministers, so we stand in both realms, and we've gotten affirmation in, in the church realm, you know, because we share the gospel in our seminars, and people get saved, and, and so, you know, we get the attaboys for that. But nobody has ever affirmed us in the business realm. I've never felt affirmed other than Rich Marshall's book and this conference here. I've never felt affirmed in, in the business world. And you know what? Now I have a burden like those old ladies. <laughs> and that is that, um, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times pastors 
have treated the business people like an ATM machine. You know, like you're just here to supply for our vision, you know, and, and they haven't realized that, that God has given us our own vision. God has given you your own vision, you know, and I, I'm not talking about this church and this pastor because I've been here. I've been here hundreds of times. You know that when, President Richard Crisco, when I talked to him before before the uh, conference, I said to him, would you please, would you please let the people see the kids. Let them get a, a vision for this place. And he said, I don't want to do that. He said, you know, we just want to bring the business people in and bless them. I said, why? BRSM has a vision for the business people. Why can't the business people have a vision for BRSM? You know? So it's not this ministry that I'm talking about. But I know you guys have had experiences like this. When Peter and I moved to Tampa, we went around and we looked at different churches. And we, we found, you know, a church that was an awesome church, a huge church in our city. Um, and the pastor was considered like, you know, one of the great spiritual leaders of our church or of our, of our city. And so we took the pastor and his wife. We'd only visited the church one time. It was a great church. And so we took the pastor and his wife out for a meal. <laughs> Our first time meeting them, and, and they said, what do you do? And, and we told them what we did. You know, we do these big, big conferences, and we bring in famous people, and, and we share the gospel, and people get saved. And do you know what this pastor said? He said, wow, I would like to see how we could take up offerings in your seminars to build our, our school. <laughs> you know, that, you know, that's just an example. Like, I know you guys, you guys know this stuff, but I just really feel that, that, um, before we have, have this commissioning and this anointing, that it would be appropriate, I believe it's in the heart of God, that, that we have one of the priests give um, a long overdue repentance to the kings. I really do, you know, for not, for not seeing like you have your own vision, you know? And I don't, I don't think I'm the person to do it. I really don't. I, I really believe that Rich Marshall is the person to do it. Three things, folks. Number one, I repent as a pastor. I may not be your pastor, but I repent as a pastor because we saw you as deep pockets and as a source of revenue for our ministry. I repent, number two, because we did not see in you the creative and powerful ministry gifting that God has put in your heart. And I repent, number three, that therefore we did not equip you for the ministry call that is on your life. I'm on my knees on purpose, folks, because uh, I didn't do this in this seminar, Tamar, but almost everywhere I go, I'm on my knees before the business people with this very thing. To repent on behalf of the priests who have mistreated the sheep in this way. Now I say at the same time that I say to you, I need to repent. I, I want to thank God that it's a new day, and I think that that day is passing. But any repentance, Cindy Jacobs taught me this really clearly, any repentance that takes place has to be, number one, clear and specific and responded to. Now, Pastor John, come, come up here with me because uh, you have the authority in this house. And uh, I, I'm a guest operating under your authority. And so I just want to stand here with, with the priest of this house and say to you, because uh, I know his heart is, is just like mine, <laughs> that, uh, that we want to repent to you. But here's what has to happen. Somebody has to respond. Because it's not enough for me to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, unless somebody also says, I receive it and I forgive you. And since we didn't plan it, who's going to do it? It's got to be a business person. Yeah, just come on up here. Just come on up here. Let's do it right. Two or three of you, it's, it's okay. Just, just to have you come on up here. Yeah, just as, as you feel led, just, just come on up here and stand in front of uh, Pastor and I. Not everybody's going to maybe speak. Just stand, stand right here and, and look, look at us. 
And now you're, you're representing business people from around the world. You're representing men and women, and you're representing the whole marketplace. And uh, so I, we saw you first. Just step up here. And uh, as, as Pastor and I speak to you, the issues are, number one, we repent for seeing you as a source of revenue. It was wrong, and I'm sorry. And I repent because we did not see your ministry gifting, and I'm sorry. And number three, that because of that, we did not equip you appropriately for your ministry place. Will you just respond, please? I receive your, uh, your apology, and I thank you for it. And it's been a long time coming, and it has provided healing to my soul for you to provide. Maybe, does anybody else want to just say a word here? Yes, I received that, and I really appreciate it. And on behalf of me and everyone else, I just really like to praise God and thank you for this special time. Amen. Tamara, you stand on both sides of this. You stand on the priestly side and the kingly side. So I think that Tamara needs to be here because what, what we've missed in the body of Christ is these dual roles of the king and the priest together. We've, we've missed it. In fact, we have said to the pastors who have to hold a job, if you had enough faith, you could quit that job. While in reality, that job is probably providing most of the people that come to the church they pastor. We need to get over this judgmental thing. And, 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 and certainly that's not the issue with Peter and Tamar, but look at what they're doing. As both ordained ministers and as ordained kings in the marketplace, operating at both sides. So we've got this group here, and we've got this group here, and then we have this group like you that stand between us. And I just want to repent to you as well, because there's been so much in the body of Christ that hasn't allowed a whole group of people to function fully in either of their callings, because we judge them. We judge them for going back to the marketplace, or we judge them for not going full-time into their church ministry. And we need to just release that as well. So I want to honor you and your husband for the position that you hold in the joint anointing. By the way, we call you pings. <laughs> priest, the priest and the king come together. Amen? <laughs> or crease, whatever we might want to do with this thing. But bless you for that. And also, just as you stand here, we repent also because of the judgment that's come your way for trying to... What well, well, we've called it putting your foot in both worlds, but the reality is there aren't two worlds. There's only one. And so we now let you, you're free to function in those places. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you all for being here with us. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Just before we introduce David Green, uh, here in the Pensacola area, if you're from Pensacola, uh, Jody Barham has started a, a business professionals monthly meeting. Uh, just tell them in 90 seconds about it, um, <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, we're presently uh, meeting at Ryan's at, on Brent Lane on the first Tuesday of every month uh, for a luncheon and, and uh, just trying to get the mind of the Lord in terms of what he wants to do here in the Pensacola area with uh, business people. Um, just briefly, the Lord, <clears throat> the Lord brought me, took me out of the business arena for a while uh, to go to the Brownsville School of Ministry and I've been through all that and graduated, and, um, and it's like the Lord has brought me full circle. And, and I've wrestled with some of this, you know, we've talked about this stuff, and it's like, am I supposed to be in business? Am I supposed to be in the ministry? And it, and it was like a spirit of confusion was on me, you know? Jesus. And I want to tell you something. So much affirmation has come forth in these last couple of days, and I'm anointed for business. I'm anointed for business. And, uh, and I'm not ashamed of that. And uh, it, it truly is a gift of God that he's put in us, and, 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 and it's part of the big picture of what God is wanting to do. And, and uh, I so much want to see what God is wanting to do here in Pensacola. The Lord impressed me a while back. We, we, we've seen revival fire touch the whole world 
from this very city. And I lived in Pensacola for three and a half years during my time, or time in school. And my next door neighbors didn't know anything about revival. In, this, in the very city where revival was, be, was poured out, and my neighbors didn't know, God wants to reach Pensacola. There's no doubt in my mind. And uh, I want to be part of that. And I know the Lord is going to use the, the vehicle of business to do this. And he's going to, this is something stirring here, people. Yes. It is stirring. Bless the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jody. Praise the Lord. I tell you, the presence of God is in this house this evening. God's going to do something special tonight. He's now finished. He's now beginning, friends. I'm going to ask Pastor Michael Rowan to introduce Mr. David Green to you. Whenever we were looking for a king to end tonight's service, uh, Brother Michael said, I know just the person. So, Mike, would you come in? Mike is the director of student ministries here. And if you're going to be here tomorrow morning, you're going to see something that you will love, friends. So if you're going to be here, get here early. Good evening. Uh, how many know that God raises up ministries and he also raises up businesses? But I'm thankful that there are many ministries that are businesses. And uh, I'm thankful for the different flavor uh, that uh, we have experienced this weekend here. Uh, we have experienced revival, are in revival, uh, people from all over the world uh, still coming in uh, weekly to be a part of what God has done here and is doing here. But I, for one, am uh, excited about what God is doing this weekend. Hobby Lobby is an organization that many of you are familiar with, if not all of you. Most of your houses are decorating most of their stuff. Uh, I was teasing David last night saying, you know, could, you could probably go in my house and say, okay, I bought that, I bought that, I bought that. And he said, yeah, I could do it. Uh, Hobby Lobby began operation on August 3rd, 1972 in a 300 square foot feet of retail space located in North Oklahoma City. This was a retail outgrowth of Greco Products, a miniature picture frame company founded by David Green in 1970. In January 1973, the operation was moved to a house near Northwest 23rd and Western, and the amount of retail space was increased to approximately 1,000 square feet. This modest beginning has grown to, as of this month, over 300 stores across the United States of America with sales in excess of $1 billion in 2001. The firm employs nearly 11,000 employees company-wide and operates in a 26-state area. And I won't go through the whole list, but over half the United States is home to Hobby Lobby stores. Hobby Lobby stores stock over 60,000 items of art and craft supplies, fashion fabrics, baskets, silk flowers, needlework, wearable art, picture framing, cards, party supplies, furniture, and a large department devoted to seasonal merchandise, and on and on the list goes. Hobby Lobby can no longer be considered just an arts and crafts store. The large selection of products and wide range of departments make Hobby Lobby the place to shop for a super selection and super savings each and every day. Hobby Lobby headquarters are located in a 1.7 million square foot manufacturing distribution and office complex located there in Oklahoma City. In addition to the corporate office, other solely owned sister companies of Hobby Lobby headquartered at this location include Greco Frame and Supply, Crafts, etc., Mardell's, and HL Realty. If you've not been in a Mardell's, that's one Christian Supercenter bookstore. I've already figured the whole thing out. I told David I've already selected the place here in Pensacola that you can bring a Mardell's when you're ready. The manufacturing area of the complex is a 725,000 square foot building adjacent to the main warehouse. This new site houses Greco's frame manufacturing facility and Worldwood's Bearwood fixtures and candle and scented products manufacturing. David is here tonight with the, his beautiful wife Barbara and uh, had the uh, incredible privilege to meet them some years ago when I went and preached at Lakeside Assembly of God in Oklahoma City. And uh, my wife, uh, my in-laws, my wife's parents uh, had developed a relationship with the Greens and they introduced us and uh, had a chance to go out last night and just uh, share and fellowship. I said, man, how did this whole thing get started? He said, Michael, he said, we may be doing over a billion dollars now. He said, but I actually started this thing when I asked somebody to loan me 600 bucks. And so how many know that God can kiss something when he wants to and explode it whenever he wants to? Amen. 
I said, do people ever come to you and ask you about what it's like to be an anointed man of God but be in a secular business? And he said, Michael, I believe that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing. He said, because secular means without God. He said, but I've, not, <laughs> I've never had more of God in my business, in my life. And I know these, uh, these wonderful people. I, I, I consider it a privilege to call them friends. And I told him, I just leaned over a moment ago, I said, man, just tear it up. I'm telling you, friends, a wealth of wisdom is about to come out of this man. And more than that, he's totally passionately in love with Jesus Christ. Would you please welcome Mr. David Green. This is big. This is big. I think I may have a hard time speaking for a minute because it is big. I thank the pastor for putting this program together. And I thank especially Rich for your ministry. Uh, this, this ministry is so needed. And I think a lot of businessmen here would say amen to that. Amen. I just wished that we knew about this uh, earlier in life. I wished I had known about it because I certainly went through a lot of years, you know, being, oh, I don't know, the leftovers, I guess. Uh, my father was a pastor, a basically Pentecostal pastor of a lot of basically small churches. I, I grew up that way, and I had a tremendous heritage. I wouldn't take anything from the heritage I had, but we didn't have knowledge to a lot of, this, of these things. I'm one of six children. My five brothers and sisters were all called to preach. They were all called by God, and to this day, they're all doing something for the Lord in terms of... Uh, they're either pastors, pastors' wives, evangelists, now or have been. And then something happened. I wasn't called. I wasn't called in the sense that we understood it anyway. And uh, it was like for many years, and I'm sure there's others here that feel the same way, but what's, what's the deal? Something is uh, defective. Something is wrong. And so I went many, many years of my life that way, and that's how come it's so an emotional thing, and I'm sorry about it. <laughs> because I have learned to know that God has a calling on my life, and he has a calling on each one of our lives, no matter what we do. And I really get angry sometimes when someone talks about secular business. When, as a businessman, everything we do sometimes is to give God everything to pray about our business and everything that we have and all of our resources and all that we do we want to glorify God it is not a secular business if we unless we make it that way I choose not to make my business sec a secular business we are we are a business that we try everything we can do to please God in all that we can do when you when you come up in a background where you know that uh, you're repeated, you know, one of the things my mother and my, my mother is one of my greatest mentors. And one of the things that I never could get out of my head is we have but one life and soon it will pass. And only what's done for Christ will last. Now you're not called to preach as, as you understand is the only calling to do something for the Lord. And you're not. And so here you have a life and it's soon going to pass and only what's done for Christ will last. And so that's kind of the dilemma you're in. If you don't understand that God has something for your life also. And I have to admit that it took me an awful long time before I learned this. I would, I would have loved to have been in this meeting here 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And it would have been such an inspiration. And so I, I, I thank those that have put this together. I thank Brother Rich for what he said today. And it just really touches my heart. I, I, I had a, 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 a terrible problem with the subject of school. Uh, I didn't do very well. The whole subject was not... 
I just, I just, I didn't do very well. And so when I was a junior and senior, I thought the neatest thing in the world was to take distributive education. Distributive education, you got a, a, you got a, a, a credit for it, and you got a credit for working. I said, how, this is heaven, you know? I'm out of school at 10 o'clock. I'm down at the local five and dime. And I would rather be any, nowhere else in the world besides at the local five and dime. A lot of times dipping fish. <laughs> so I'm not proud of that, by the way. I didn't have any education past high school. I'm not proud of that. I, I suggest my sons, my grandchildren to go to college and get a good education. It just not, wasn't, seemed like it wasn't right for me that uh, I just, I clicked on the retail business. I enjoyed it. And, uh, and so, and by the way, I met my wife, this Barbara. I want you to stand, Barbara. She worked in the candy department. She was real sweet. And uh, her first impression of me was this, I was a smart aleck. <laughs> and uh, she was probably right, because I was stock boy going on manager. <laughs> but anyway, I met her, and she's my million dollar baby now, and a five and found in a five and dime. So we're, I, uh, been married now for 42 years. We've got three children, they're all in the business. We have nine grandchildren. And God has blessed us with those, with our family, and we're very proud of it. About, uh, I worked for a company called TGMY for about 18 years after I got out of school. And uh, as I, when I left them, I was a supervisor for quite a few. At that time, we went from five and dimes to family centers. They were pretty good, uh, sizable uh, stores. And in 1970, as was already said, uh, we were working, I was working for TGNY, and we thought, God, I knew God had a plan for my life, or I didn't know it at that time, but looking back, I, knew, I know God's hand has been in all of this. We had three children, it took all the money that we made to, um, to finance our company, I mean, to finance our home, and, and, and there was no money to start a business, so we went to the bank and borrowed $600. And that's probably the only reason I wish that I'm glad I never res read a business book or went to business college or anything is because I'm sure they would have told me not to start a billion dollar company on $600. <laughs> but for all other reasons I wished I had of like right now when I'm speaking in front of you. But uh, I'm pretty sure they would have told us not to have done that. Our boys were seven and nine at the time. and. Uh, we started making little miniature frames in our garage. And it, we would pay them seven cents. Uh, like I said, they were seven years, nine years old. We'd say seven cents to make these frames. They would use their hands and tighten these little clamps up and make these little frames. And it was really child labor. A lot of people have problems with that. In 1972, I was still working for TGNY. I couldn't sink the ship. I got in business with someone. I gave him a piece of the, of the action, which wasn't much action because I didn't have anything to pay him. And, uh, and by the way, it, we should never get in business with someone and be unequally yoked. Later, God just worked it out that we don't have any partners now. And uh, I think it's uh, something that God wouldn't have us to do. But. Uh, in 1972, as has been said before, we opened our first store. I was still working for TGMY. I would have sunk the ship the first year. Our total sales from August to December was 3,000 and some odd dollars. Our payroll for hiring this fellow was over 50%. And it was only the frames we were selling in the back room that we were manufacturing that caused it to, uh, to be able to continue. And, uh, and by the way, Barbara, my wife, it wasn't for her, we wouldn't even be here because she was there every day packing frames, working in the store while I, I was uh, making a living for us. So as you can see, with $600, you're not going to, 
you're not going to go very far, very fast. It took us a year to pay that off, one year. We thought we were doing a very good job. We went back to the bank and asked them to loan us $1,000. They wouldn't loan us to us. That happened to be, by the way, a bank that made national news called Penn Square Bank. They went out of business. I often wondered if they had loaned us that $1,000. First, it might have been the only good loan they made. And second, we may have saved that bank. But anyway, Barbara worked five years for no pay. And when I came on board in, in, in 75 and left TGNY, I thought the company would float. Then I came over, and she had, hadn't been paid up to that time. And uh, of course, now she's been paid, and she, de well, she, anyway, she shows up now and then. In 1975, it was a big decision for us, but you look back on all of these steps and you know that God's hand was in it all. It's just amazing how that God went before us. And uh, I was earning $26,000 a year for TGNY, and I came over to work for ourselves for $13,000. Our company did $150,000 sales in 1975. 94 so you can see it was not a big company and I was leaving a company that did two million uh, two billion dollars And obviously it's like wow. What about security here? Well today all of our companies will do a billion and a half and hop and, and PGY is gone so the security isn't in the world the security is in doing and following what God would have us to do Excuse me just a minute. As being read, we have nine different companies. God has given us all these companies. In fact, we even have a movie company, my oldest son, that runs our Christian bookstores. We have 20 of them. And uh, he's created a, a documentary about the five uh, missionaries that went down in Ecuador, got killed, and now he's doing a movie. He has about 12 full-time people that are making movies, and right now, or very soon, we'll be filming a, uh, a movie about this, not just the documentary. And uh, we have two employees that work for us. That both of them were earning over $500,000 a year. It went to work for us because they didn't like what they were producing. Of course, we're not paying them anything like that. But they're people that want to work for the Lord. They're business people that want to do the right thing. And so we're excited about that being one of the businesses that God has put us into. As, I, as we as said earlier, we have over 300 stores. There's a lot of those numbers. They're a little bit old. I don't know where you got them. Uh, I know where you got them. My secretary sent them to you, but I think they're a couple years old. We have over two and a half million feet of warehouse space now, and we're constantly, about every year, we're having to add because we pick up about 100 to $150 million worth of sales every year. Uh, this year, our collective companies will, will our sales will be about $1.5 billion. But better than the fact that it does uh, $1.5 billion, we earn three times what the average retail chain would earn. So basically, we earn what a $4.5 billion company would, would make. And by the end of next year, we'll have zero debt except for real estate debt. So. So obviously, that's a miracle in our lives, and we know that we can't take $600 and do this without God being involved in all of that all along the way. We know we give him all the glory for that. I guess I, guess I want to tell you a little story that, well, I guess for the first time, that I never had a minister to tell me that I had a calling on my life, but I guess the first time that, that I want to tell you a little story about what happened to me when it kind of God just gave me a hint that I might have a calling on my life because for many years it was my brothers and sisters that had a calling on their life and I didn't. And uh, went to a huge uh, convention in Cleveland, Tennessee, large assembly there. And I was coming back on the plane, it was a tremendous time that we worshiped and 
And the Lord just spoke to my spirit and says, uh, you know, I want you to give $30,000. We're a very small company, way, way back in our early conception. And I said, God, I can't give $30,000. You know, how can you be asking me? But I felt my spirit, God says, I want you to give $30,000. So, I, on the plane, I just kept thinking, this can't be. And finally, I said, you know what? If I write four checks for 7500 and make them a month apart, I think we can do it. So we did that, and we sent it to a department that was responsible for the literature because that was where God asked me to put this money, that, that print the gospel. And it wasn't very long after that I heard that on the day that I wrote that, there was four missionaries from Africa praying for literature, and they had predetermined it would cost $7,500 to print this literature. I says, you know what? Maybe I have a calling. One of the things I think God requires of us in business is to be bold. Today we live in a time when everything has to be politically correct. And if we're not careful as Christians, that will become a concern of ours, is to be politically correct. And uh, God has dealt with us on that. We haven't been as bold as we should be. But we're, we're trying to do everything God would ask us to do and be as bold as we can. I can remember one Christmas day, I was sitting at the table reading the paper. This is on Christmas Day. And I looked for that in that paper and I could not find a single Merry Christmas. Not a single one. Christ had been taken out at Christmas. And God just spoke to my spirit and said, Yeah, but you're selling Easter bunnies and you're selling Santa Clauses. And I knew we had to do something. And so from that day on, every single city that we're in, there's a full page ad. And you will see it here in Pensacola this coming Sunday is Easter, or next, no, a week from tomorrow. You will see a full page ad. A full page ad will be from Houston to Chicago, from all the way out Colorado to North Carolina. We'll be in every single city, over 200 and some odd papers simply because we have some multi stores in some cities there's not as many pa papers as there are stores but in the bottom of that full page ad we'll have a 1-8800 number need him that you can call and ask and we put our name very small there so that if you want to respond that's the purpose of that and we have literally thousands of people respond to that and we have literally hundreds of people that the 1-800 need him people tell us come to know Jesus every time we run one of these ads. We do a lot, and I'll ex express a little bit in terms of literature around the world. But one day I was sitting and I know that God spoke to my spirit and said, you, you have we have 1,600, 16,000 employees now. He said, I put those people in your charge, and yet you're doing these things around the world. So we hired a full-time chaplain. And right now you can go up and down the halls, and you can see on mornings various departments having Bible studies. And people can come to this with their needs, this chaplain, and we've had many people come to know the Lord because of this chaplain. But we try to make an atmosphere in our company to whereas that everybody feels free that they are able to witness. We've heard about secretaries because they see our heart witnessing to their managers and the managers getting saved in the office. But there's, there's a atmosphere of freedom there. It's not one that we cross the line in terms of uh, pushing our religion on somebody but trying to live the life that someone would want to know about Jesus. And so these are the things in fact, just this last week, one of the men in my, our company that hires all of our managers said, you know, I was taking this new manager around and I opened this office and there was three ladies in there praying, so I had to back off until they got finished. 
but this is the thing that we really encourage in our business. This is not a secular business. This is a business that has been given to God. When you read our web and it says that we try to run our business on based on biblical principles, and that's what we try to do, we err. We have to ask God forgive in this from time to time. But at one time, he began to speak to my sons, myself, and several other officers in the company about our being open on Sundays. I don't judge anybody. I wouldn't want anybody to have judged me, but I judge no one that's open on Sundays. I'm speaking for what God was speaking to us. He wanted us to close on Sundays. So I decided... that I would start in Nebraska and do it by state. We only had three stores in Nebraska at the time. <laughs> I'm sorry I, had, I hadn't greater faith than that. Looking back, I wished I had greater faith, but I worked on the faith that I had. So we closed the three stores, and obviously it's, it makes big news. It was printed up, in, and I told the man in charge of my advertising, I said, now, if this works, we're going to go ahead and close some more states. So he told the newspaper that. So he gives me a copy of the newspaper ad about his closing in Omaha. And I'm looking at the newspaper ad, and it says, you know, if this works out, we're going to go ahead and close the rest of those stores. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, that's the deal, huh? You're going to be obedient if, you're, if it profits you. That's the deal. So I had to call the person in charge of advertising. says, look, we're closing all the stores, okay? At the time, we were doing $100 million in sales on Sundays. It's 12% of our sales. And I think anybody in retail knows it's the top dollars that's your profitable dollars. You can lose 10% or 12% of your sales, and you can lose 50 or 100% of your profit. But this is what God asked us to do. And for two years, we saw, we saw our sales go down. We saw our profits go down. But after I got finished closing those stores, it started going up. And now we have a company that is totally, totally unlike any retail company in terms of the profitabil our profitability. But one of the things that I might say is this can also be a negative, but the positives outweigh the negatives. And that is that every single ministry, or almost every single ministry, in every single town, you'll get a phone call. Because you love the Lord, and you love ministries, and you will get them. We get approximately 300 calls a month, minimum, for different areas of donations, at least 300 calls a day. My secretary says she gets 10 or 12 a day. And I thank God, but I thank God wants us to be focused. Everyone that has a ministry has to have some focus. T to be honest with you, we respond to all of these negatively. We try positively, but... We, we say we can't do that. We try to say that as good as God is to us, as good as he is, we're limited. But try to tell them about a God that can take care of all their needs and try to lead them to their true supplier. But you will have a problem. If you put signs in 300, almost 340 with all of our Mardale stores, that every single store, we, we don't want them to know we're just closed on Sunday. We want them to know that we're closed on Sunday so our employees can worship and be with their family. It's on every single door. And when you... And when you do that, you're going to create a tremendous amount of, of uh, requests. But it's a, it's a positive thing because we try to witness in that and, and to try to say God is, your, it, God is your source. And one of the other things that we've learned in terms of our giving is to not put God in, our bo in a box. 
I used to belong to a denominational, and there was no way that I would give a dime outside that, that denominational box. And I've come to learn that God is bigger than our denominational box. And so what we have tried to do, rather than shotgun our giving, is we've tried to go to the Lord and ask Him what He would have us do. And we know, we know that what we're doing is what God would have us to do. We know that we know that we know. Because we've spent many hours in prayer asking God, and we've asked the family to ask God, what would you have us to do? And so instead of doing a thousand things, we've got two or three things that God has put us on, and, and we feel good about what we're doing. I, I gave you a real quick $1970-$600 to bang. We're doing $1.5 billion. Let me give you just one little story in between there that's very important to us, and that was in 1986. In 1986, uh, we lost over a million dollars, and we were a small company in 1986. It was a significant amount of money, 1986. It was a time when I found, I found myself underneath my desk, and the only reason I can look back and say, why were you under that desk? Well, it was because it was a huge, big, oak desk, and the world was falling in. And I guess I thought there was more protection under there. But week in and week out, month in, month out, seemed like forever, I got under that desk. And at home, I got under my closet. And I found out that the Lord was trying to do something in my life. You know, the scripture says he chastises those that he loves. He loves me so much. <laughs> I can witness. But it was the worst and the best of times. It was the worst days, but it was also the best days. I wasn't ready for what God had for us. He didn't want us to do a billion and a half with the person that he had. And one of the things, if I had a mandate, or if we have a mandate, if we have only one hint, mandate, it's to have clean hands and a pure heart. We have to die to pride. God gives us, God has given me one talent, I'm convinced, and that's I'm a merchant, and that's all. I don't know whether he could handle me if he gave me two, but that's all. But I have to give him all the glory because he gave that to me. And we, we, are, we are, that talent I found out when he removed his anointing from that talent for a period of time was worth nothing. Our talents have no value whatsoever when God removes and if he removes his anointing from our lives. And that happened, and it was not a good thing. But we've tried to learn from that, and hopefully we never have to go to that school, although we have to every day. We have to die to ourselves and be as small as we can possibly be so he can be big in our lives. He wants to be big in our lives. And you know, he doesn't measure the things like we measure. We measure things different. God measured the widow that was the giving. That was the lady that gave. It wasn't the rich man. It was that lady. You know who gave? Someone came to me and says, I want to do what you're doing. And I don't know, I'd never even thought of this. But in one second, I said, you know what? I want to be my mother. My mother would crochet a dolly, take it to a bazaar for missions. No one would buy it. She would give a dollar so that she could give a dollar to missions. And this is the mother that I had. The purity of her, that's who I want to be. I want to be my, like my mother. It's, a, it's exciting. I want, to, I want to talk for just a moment of some of the things that God has allowed us to do. One of the things he's allowed us to do is to buy properties for ministries. And if any of you are interested and would want to call me on the phone, uh, don't tell my secretary you want us to buy some, some property for you because you won't get through. Tell her you, you're interested in buying some properties, and I'll be glad, and she'll get 
you'll get through. But it is something that I think businessmen ought to do. Uh, within the last 12 months, God has given us the ability to buy 12 different properties, three of which this world paid $200 million for, that we bought for $27 million. Three of these properties. One of them was in Lynchburg. We bought for uh, Jerry Falwell. He's going to put a, a university for lawyers. And he's also going to move his uh, Baptist Road, Baptist Church. He's going to change the name of the street. We have some property there that will probably develop into a shopping center. But General Electric had that, that, that property first, and they had $90 million in it, and we bought it for uh, less than uh, uh, $11 million. There's a piece of property in, in, uh, in Chicago that safety clean, went out of business. They, have, uh, they had $54 million, and we paid $9 million for there's another piece of property that the world had $74 million in Angleton, Texas. You're from Houston, I think you would know that we're able now to give to Joel uh, Osteen. This is what the world paid $200 million for. God's given to ministries at $28 million. The government allows you, if you keep this property for one year, they allow you to write it off at not what you pay for it, but what an honest appraisal is. And we try to get an honest appraisal. And these, these properties will probably, well, in the end, they won't cost us anything. They won't cost us a dime. In fact, the first few properties that we bought for the first three years, we gained $7 million in tax because of taxes. Now, we understand that the government can come back and they can say, this is worth a different amount. And that's fine. Someone testify. <laughs> we want to be in a position to where that if the government says it, because it's subjective, and we're trying to get as legal as we can, clean hands, pure heart, everything above board, but it's something if you're interested in doing and you would like to talk to us about it, let us know. Uh, but we have a budget for that, and I might tell everybody that our budget is gone. We, there's only so much. What it is, it, it takes cash flow for a period of time until that you can use that as a deduction. But it's, I think it fulfills the scripture that talks about God would take the earthly goods and give it to the godly. We're just seeing God do that. And it's so exciting to, to do that. We, we, we're excited about that. Two of the things that we're, that we're involved in that God has put us into is the printing of God's Word. And I will close with these, these two examples. One of them is the Book of Hope. The Book of Hope uh, is uh, umbrellaed by the, the Assemblies of God, and you can buy three of these for one dollar. And God just spoke to our family after we had been praying for some time that we needed to do the Book of Hope. The Book of Hope is the four Gospels. It's, uh, nothing is, it's in chrono chronological order. It's given to school children of all ages. It, uh, it's being given out into over 60 countries. And he just, he, he touched my heart, my son's heart at the same time. And in fact, my son's, Dad, I didn't know that God touched you for this too, but this is the way that God works. He just confirmed that this is what he wanted us to do. And so we started out about six years ago. In the first year, we bought, we, we financed one and a half million of these books. And it was a, during that time that I had this little catchphrase that we all have. You can't outgive God. And God just kind of spoke and said, have you tried? <laughs> it's sort of like he's saying to my spirit, you know, I'm blessing you faster than you're blessing with what your resources are. And so there I am. Well, God, I'm going to take these resources so that I can build a business so that I can give you more. No, David, I can provide for that. You need to, as I bless you, you need to give. And so we decided that every year we would increase that by six million books. 
So as of today, we have financed 137 and a half million of these books. They say that the average book is exposed to four people. So now we've got almost a tenth of the population of the planet now has been exposed to the Gospels. It has a sinner's prayer at the back of the book. And so I'm not going to stop. Next year, this year we did 37.5 million books. Next year it's going to be 43.5 million. Why should I stop as long as God doesn't stop? Six years ago, I had no idea that we could do this. It was an impossible dream. But what happened is every year, it's, he's, he's super, he has supplied the needs and he's made it. But now it's like he's oversupplied for it and we needed to come up with another project. And the family prayed again. And we went back to the, the Lord and says, Now, Lord, what would you have us to do? And he says, Now I want you to put the gospel into every single home in China. If, most of you may know Dick Eastman. And Dick Eastman's minister is Every Home for Christ. And they literally mean every home. Every single home. Systematically, they put literature. And I said, Dick, if we're going to do this, we don't want to do 400 million homes. And then you tell me that we've got the wrong literature. So they've been working diligently. They have it. And we have now started. And right now, 4 million Chinese are seeing the gospel of Christ every month and the intent is to let this grow until in seven years every single Chinese will have the gospel in their hands. It's a tangible thing. There's 400 million homes. There's 3.25 Chinese in every home. And so we, we, we feel like it looks impossible, but if we haven't learned yet, God can do the impossible. With $600, we'll never learn. <laughs> but we've seen him work, and God has been good. And uh, yesterday or two days ago, my wife told me, she says, David, I'm praying that the Lord will larger tent. And I says, Barbara, are you praying God will enlarge your tent? <laughs> she says, no. I says, how about giving me a break? God is good. Thank you very much. David and Barbara Green, ladies and gentlemen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. How many know that God is raising up men and women in the marketplace to be anointed ministers for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Amen. How many know that ministry is not just something that a paid staff of professionals do? It's not just for pastors and apostles and prophets and teachers. That ministry is something that everybody does. Ministry is something that everybody gets involved in. And I'm so thankful that God has anointed people in the business realm and in the marketplace to spread the gospel, the uncompromising gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Friend, how many know that God is going to have his church whatever way he wants to have it? Amen? And he'll do whatever he has to do, and he'll use whoever he has to use in order for his kingdom to be glorified. Amen? Let's just give him praise one more time. Come on, put your hands together. Father, we glorify you, and we know, Lord Jesus, that you will have your church. You will have your church, Father, in these last days. Father, raise people up in the business world, in the marketplace. Father, anoint men and women of God to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, you may be seated again. Man, this is great. I'm going to go get a loan for $600 tomorrow morning. Amen. Well, I don't want to further or prolong anything anymore. Um, this man, I respect more than anybody in the world. He's my pastor. And he is a mentor of mine, and I love him so very much. Please give a warm welcome to Pastor John Kilpatrick. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Flattery will get you nowhere. I know that you've had a long day, and I know that uh, we just heard such wonderful, wonderful stuff. But tonight, I'd like to have the opportunity to lay hands on you in a moment, but I am going to speak. I'd like to have the opportunity to pray over you and lay hands on you and to send you forth. And I just can't tell you how blessed we are to have hosted this seminar, Anointed for Business. Matter of fact, I want to make the announcement tonight. I'm going to have one of these every year. And, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have one of these every year, and I promise you it's going to be one of the best seminars we have all year. And man, this has been so good. I just hope everybody that's been here can come back. And I wanted to say this also tonight. Um, um, there's someone here that I think deserves special recognition. Ward Simpson has absolutely... <laughs> Ward Simpson has absolutely done a, a wonderful job. Ward is a, is a wonderful man. He's a very wise man. I trust his judgment, trust his wisdom. And the Lord put him here at a very crucial time in this church's history. And he has been a tremendous blessing, not only to BRSM, but to our whole church and to many more people. And I can see his ministry is growing. And uh, I'm so glad that his family can be here for this first Anointed for Business seminar to see him in action. And uh, Ward, I want you to stand. We love you, man. God bless you. Bless you. <clears throat> now tonight, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles just for a little bit. And um, I want to just share with you out of my heart something that I feel like everybody needs to hear, not because I preach it, but because it's just a wonderful truth. It changed my life, and I hope that it'll be instrumental in changing your life. We're going to go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, we're going to read just two verses. And then after a while in the course of the message, I'll be taking you to other places. And I'm going to be as brief as possible. Believe me, I've, I've got the time in mind. And I know that the mind can't comprehend more than the posterior can endure. I know that. Chapter 3. Verse 8 of 1 Peter. Has everybody found it? 1 Peter is right before 2 Peter. <laughs> the Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful and be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that you are there and to call that you should inherit a blessing. Now tonight, <clears throat> I want to just take you on a little journey if I could. I know this is a different kind of a seminar. This is not really so much a sermon as it is just I want to talk to you out of my heart for a little bit. And I, I can't help but to tell you a few stories personal stories, some of them in regard to Brownsville, some of them personal otherwise. I hope you don't think we're trying to center anything on ourselves because we're not. But um, I want to tell you some things that I feel like that you need to hear. First of all, what I'm going to share with you tonight is something that absolutely changed my life. And this happened before revival broke out of Brownsville. There's been over 4 million people through these doors from all over the world since 1995. And God has blessed us to host people from many, many nations from all over this planet as people heard about what God did on Father's Day and they began to come. And over four million people have come. But before revival broke out, if someone were to say to me 
Brother Kilpatrick, what do you think was the number one prerequisite for revival? I would tell them beyond any doubt it was prayer. Prayer is the first prerequisite for revival. You can't have revival without prayer. If someone were to say to me, Pastor, what would you say was the second prerequisite for revival at Brownsville? I would say unequivocally, without any hesitation, it was what I'm going to tell you tonight in a synopsis. Now, by the way, if you want to after the service, you can go by. I'll only be able to preach one part, but if you want to after the service, you can go by and pick up. There's five parts to this, and I'm just going to give you a synopsis, a quick synopsis tonight. But out in the foyer, you can go by to the service and pick these up. And it's called, I'm going to deal with the subject of the mystery and the power of a blessing. The mystery and power of a blessing. First of all, a blessing has a mystery associated with it. A mystery is something that's hidden. You've got to search for it. It's not out in the open where you stumble over it. And second, there's a power in, associated, in association with a blessing. And there's two things that I want to say in regard to blessing and blessings. Blessings can be houses and land and cars and money and IRAs and retirement accounts and things like that. That can be blessings, and health can be blessings and all that. But blessings come about because of the blessing, singular. And I want to say this to you tonight, too, before I really get too involved. I'm not real smart. Um, I'm not real smart. But, and I'm, I'm not rich. Regardless of what the paper said, I'm not rich. <laughs> I'm not. Um, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination. But I want you to know, uh, I, didn't, I didn't finish college either because I had to go to work early and help my mother. Even when I got married to Brenda and we had our first baby, I had to return home and help my mother. So I wasn't able to finish college either. But you're looking tonight at not a smart man, a real smart man, but you're looking at a blessed man. That's right. God has always blessed my wife and I. That's right. And um, whenever my wife and I got married, we've always tried to live for God. We haven't been perfect, but we've always tried to live for God. And um, when we got married, uh, we dated for 17 months. I never touched her in an untoward way because I knew one day I was going to be a preacher. And I knew that I wanted to please God, number one, but I didn't want my wife to one day sit in a pew like tonight and look up here at the man behind the podium and say he's a hypocrite because whenever we were dating, he had his hands all over me and he almost raped me before we got married. We were both virgins when we went to the altar. And we have remained faithful to each other through these years. And I thank God for that. Amen. Amen. My, wife is, my wife is a wonderful, wonderful mother and a great grandmother. And uh, we want to serve the Lord and please the Lord. So we, we are certainly not wealthy. We're not business people. But we're blessed. There's a kiss of God on our lives and on my life that I know is there. And it's there, I guess, for a lot of reasons, but mainly because of Calvary. And I want to tell you, that same blessing is on your life also, but you've got to come to recognize it. Now, I want to say this right off the bat. I do not believe in luck. I do not believe in luck. I believe in blessings from God. Somebody says, you're the luckiest thing in the world. No, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And listen, this business of being born with a silver spoon in your mouth, no. You're born with a kiss of God on your life. You're born again with a kiss of God on your life, and you need to move in that Amen. and not get your eyes off of that. Amen. Now, let me tell you something that happened to me that changed my life. Um, I've been, I, call, I was called to preach at 14, and I've been pastoring now for about 32 years. And whenever we built the new building across the street, this is our family life center here, fire hit our building across the street. It won't be finished until next month. But we was over there for a number of years. That's where revival came down. That's where revival broke out. And so after we had the new building completed, um, 
it was the first few weeks that we had it completed. I was walking around there praying. And I always went to the church every Saturday night and prayed, like I've done for a long time. I'd always go down and pray, and then I'd go home and get my sermon. And, of course, I'd pray other times during the week, too, but I'd always go in the church and just pray. So after we built the new church, uh, I told the board when we was building it, I've, I've told them, I said, I love brass music in church, you know. I like guitars, and I like keyboards and organ music, piano, and all that. But I said... I love brass music, and I want brass music in the church. And I said, let's build an orchestra pit. And they said, you really want to? I said, yeah. I said, they say if you build it, they'll come. That's a lie, friend. They, <laughs> that's not a guarantee, I promise you. So the board went along with me. We built an orchestra pit. And uh, out of a church this big, you know, nobody came and, and, and was playing in the church. We just, you know, and so uh, after we built the church and had the new orchestra pit, I had to pay a guy to come over and play a trumpet for our dedication service. I had to pay him to come from Mobile. I had to pay him $75 to come for our dedication service back in 1991. It was wonderful. We had a great day that day, and he blew that trumpet. I mean, he blew spit all over that place. Yeah, you could just see the spit spraying in the, in the TV lights. I mean, it was, gore it was wonderful to me. But the next Sunday I came in, nobody in the orchestra pit. And um, so I was just, you know, I just frustrated. And then I came back the next Sunday, house full, nobody in the orchestra pit. I told the board, if we build it, they'll come. Nobody in there. So after several weeks, I went back in the church, you know, and I went in one Saturday night and I called myself praying. But I wasn't praying, I was belly aching. How many of you know there's a difference between prayer and belly aching? And I went down to the orchestra pit, and I would just, I mean, it was in the dark. I always prayed in the dark, you know, and I just went down to the orchestra pit, and I just started, <laughs> I just started, you poor me. And I just started belly aching. How many of you know the Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise? And how many of you know he never said, enter into his gates with self-pity and, and having a pity party? And so I was down in the orchestra pit, and I was just whimpering, and just, just I was in a bad way. I just I felt, I felt, you know, just horrible. And this is the first time this ever happened to me in my whole life. The Lord rebuked me privately. I was by myself, but the Lord rebuked me so sternly that I felt it so sternly. And here's what he said to me. I said, Lord, I'm just so and so, this and that. I'm just so and so. And have you ever seen a kid get his rear end popped in public? You know, just a, kid, a parent pop their rear end and the kids get this look on their face? It was like God popped my rear end in the church and I just got so humiliated. And here's what the Lord said to me. He said, well, stop cursing it. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. And that's the first time that it ever registered in my mind that with my mouth I wasn't cussing something, but I was cursing it. You understand that? I wasn't cussing it, but I was cursing it. And let me tell you, a blessing is speaking something that you desire to see come to pass, something wonderful and good. A curse is speaking something that you don't desire to see come to pass. So I've got a question for you. Why would we ever speak a curse over anything? Why would we ever say something that we don't want to see come to pass in our life? Why would you ever say to your child, you're never going to amount to nothing? You're a deadbeat. That's all you've ever been. That's all you ever will be. Why would you ever say that to your child? Why would you say something to your spouse? Why would you say something to your grandchildren? Or why would you say something even about yourself? Where you curse yourself or curse your family, curse your pastor, curse your church, curse your music director. Why would you do that? Why would you even let something like that come out of your mind, out of your mouth, if you don't want to see something like that come to pass? And that was the first time that ever really registered in my spirit that I was speaking a curse out of my mouth. And I was speaking it over that place called the orchestra pit. It wasn't that big, but it was just a, a place where I wanted to see some brass in the church and I wanted to hear some brass music in church. So I mean, when the Lord said that to me, it so embarrassed me. Just me and him now, but it so embarrassed me that I left and went home, left the church, went home that night. And friend, I'm a quick learner. 
You don't have to take me to the woodshed and whip me. Just hit me one time. I'll learn real quick. Amen? You don't have to whip me. Don't take your belt off. You don't have to cut a switch. Just wh whack me one time and I'll learn. And so I went home and I, I kept, it kept ringing over and over my ears. Curse. Stop cursing it. You know, like that. Cursing it. Cursing it. Cursing it. Cussing. Cursing. And I began to realize and, and disseminate in my own mind that I had released something in that building that I did not want to see come to pass. So all week long, I couldn't wait to get back in there the next Saturday for my time of prayer. So man, when 5 o'clock came the next Saturday, I headed to the church. I walk into the church in the dark again. And I remember, friend, I'll never forget as long as I live, I'll never forget this. I walk down the orchestra pit. I lift my hands up like a priest. This time I wasn't moving in fear. I wasn't moving in pity. I was moving in faith. This time I walked in there and I lifted up my hands like this. And I said, first of all, I said, orchestra pit, I apologize to you. <laughs> and I said, I've come to repent. And I have come to ask the Holy Spirit to let me unsay what I spoke over you last week. And I said, I have asked the Holy Spirit to let me revoke and cancel over you what I have released out of my mouth. And I remember I lifted my hands up like this in the orchestra pit, and I said, here's some of the things I said. I can't remember everything I said. But I said, orchestra pit, in the name of Jesus, I bless you. And I said, I release the blessings of the Lord on you. And I said, I speak that God make you so Blessed that such a blessing be upon you that the favor of God is going to be so manifest that people that play brass instruments will be so attracted to you that they'll begin to call and say, do you all have a place where I can play my instrument at the church? Come on. And I said, even people that drive by this church that's not even saved that play instruments, I said, I speak that even when they drive by this church, there's going to be such an attraction about you that they're going to feel a pull toward this church. They may play in high school, they may play in the symphony, but I said, I speak in the name of Jesus that you're going to become so attractive that they're going to feel a compulsion to call and say, can I come to that church and play my instrument? Come on. Let me tell you what happened. Came back the next Sunday, there was nobody there still. But I kept blessing it. Within 30 days, here's what happened. Within 30 days, I received a telephone call, and, and you people here at Brownsville know Russ Urban. He, he was a retired colonel. Out of the Air Force, we used to pastor him when I pastored in Warner Robins, Georgia. And um, I pastored him for six years there before they moved. And he moved up there and retired as a, as a full bird colonel in, uh, in Plattsburgh. And so I was already down here. I went to Evansville, Indiana from there, and I was already down here. So he called up one day, and he said, Pastor John, he said, listen, I've got an opportunity at a job there in Pensacola. And he said, um, as an ROTC, ROTC instructor at Pensacola High School, he said, there's three other people vying for the job. But he said, I got an opportunity to go there and to, to try out to get that job. And he said, man, I want you to be praying. I said, Russ, that's great. And he said, we're going to fly in. I said, well, listen, you and Bonnie don't stay at a hotel. I said, y'all stay with us. Just stay with me and Brenda. So they did. They came and stayed with us. He said, listen, before I hang up, there's one thing I forgot to tell you. He said, you never knew this the whole time I... You pastored me in Warner Robins. But he said, I play a trumpet. And he said, um, I just wondered when I come, could I bring my trumpet? Come on. And I said, no, nah, we, we can't do that. <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, he brought that trumpet. Let me tell you what happened. That Sunday night he brought that trumpet. The Spirit of God came down so powerfully in Brownsville, over 100 people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The next Sunday, he stayed over, and he played again, and that night, over 75 people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I love Russ, and he's, he's, he, was a, he was an icebreaker. And what happened was, when he came, and by the way, I told him, I said, Russ, you're going to get that job. He said, how do you know? I said, I got connections. <laughs> sure enough, he got the job. They moved to Pensacola, and they're still here. He may even be here tonight. I don't know, but they're still here in Pensacola. As a matter of fact, he's on our board now. And as soon as that ice was broken, as soon as he started standing there and playing that trumpet, 
First news you know, we had to tell people, please, we don't have any more room in the orchestra pit. You see what I'm saying? Now listen to me. After it went from there, the Lord spoke to me and he said, now do you see what I'm talking about in regard to a blessing? And I said, yes, I do. And it really began to dawn on me that I had been cursing something. An orchestra pit, I've been cursing it and didn't even realize it. You know, a lot of times, friend, we can do things that we don't even know we're doing them. Can you say amen? amen? One of the things that so grabbed me, the Holy Spirit said, I want you to call your family home, and he said, I want you to repent to them. And I said, okay. He, I said, Lord, what should I repent of? He said, for cursing your family. And I began to think about Brenda and I trying to be good parents, you know. Nobody's perfect parents. And I, I tried to always encourage my children, you know, and bless them. And not like I do now, but I tried to always encourage them, et cetera, et cetera. And so I called my boys home, and uh, John Michael came in from Lee College at, at Cleveland, and, and Scott works for UPS here in Pensacola. So I called him home. And uh, used to at our house, whenever we'd have a little family powwow, Brenda would always sit in my lap in my recliner in the den, and the boys would always sit in the fireplace by my chair. And we'd have our little family powwow if something was wrong in the family, you know, if I had to get on to them. So now they're grown boys. You know, John Michael, six foot five, and Scott, grown man, he had, he had a child of his own by then. So I called them home, and I, they said, Dad, what do you want? I said, just come home. So they both came home on Saturday, just them. And uh, Brenda sat in my lap like old times, you know. And I said, boys, I've called you home today because I want to ask you to forgive me. They said, Dad, forgive you for what? I said, forgive me for the times that I've cursed you and didn't realize it. And they said, well, well how did you ever curse us? I said, well, just saying things over you that I didn't want to see come to pass. Maybe I said it out of fear. Maybe I said it out of insecurity. Maybe I said it because I saw you going away that I thought you shouldn't go and I was trying to speak strongly enough to you to turn you, but yet I was cursing you. And I said, I'd just like to ask you to forgive me. <clears throat> and they said, oh, Dad, is that what this is about? Today's Saturday. We could, we could be doing things today, and here we are at your house. And I said, shut up, boy. So I remember, listen, listen, I remember, I'll never forget as long as I live, I had my firstborn stand up first, Scott, and I walked up to him as his dad, and just like I did in that orchestra pit when I raised my hands up like a priest, I walked up to him and I put my hand over his face, and I began to bless him. And whenever I began to bless him, when I removed my hand, there was tears running down his face. And then... When I got through with him, I had my firstborn, and he's a big old boy. I had tiptoe to get him. But when I touched him, he started vibrating. And that was before revival. And I'd never seen people vibrate like that before, but he just, the power of God came on him, just vibrated. And when I removed my hand, his face just wet with tears. And then I called Brenda, and I said, come here. Brenda is the type you never have to hit her, just swing at her, and she's gone. She's a glory hog. You don't even have to touch her, you know, just, poof, she's gone, there she is. And so I blessed my wife, and it worked so well, I thought, whew, bless myself here, you know, <laughs> glory to God. Whoa, man. <clears throat> you know. <clears throat> so then I went to the church, and I saw what God did there in my family. So then I went to the church. And when I got to the church, the Lord said, I want you to start speaking a blessing over the choir. And I, I started speaking this blessing over the choir. And some of the things I said over the choir was this. I remember I, in the dark, I stood there, lifted up my hands just like a priest. And I just stretched them out over the choir like this. And I just waved them back and forth. And I'm telling you, friend, I don't know what there is about it. But as soon as I raised my hands in that choir area and, and started blessing the choir, I felt power in that church as soon as I lifted my hands. I, I don't know, there's something about a federal headship of a pastor, something about a clean hands and a pure heart, like you were talking about. But when I lifted my hands like that and I began to bless the choir, I could feel power begin to 
just moving there. And here's some of the things I began to say with the choir. I said, I speak in the name of Jesus that this choir, I said, everybody that's in the choir for self-aggrandizement, everybody that's in the choir to be seen and to be heard for the wrong reasons, for fleshly reasons, I said, I bless the choir for it to thin down. And I said, I speak that the Lord fill this choir with people that only want to know him, love him, honor him, serve him, and worship him. Five things. I spoke that every Saturday night. People that want to know him, love him, honor him, serve him, and worship him. Everybody else that's in this choir for the wrong reason, I said, I speak that it be blessed to empty itself and to go down to what it has to go down to before it can go up with everybody in there that's there for the right reasons. And the choir went down to about 20 people. And my choir leader came to me one Sunday morning. He said, Pastor, there's only about 20 people in the choir. And I said, praise God. And I said, Jesus, I didn't know it was this bad, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I think it went on down to about 18 or 20, somewhere in there, and it went on down. And then all of a sudden, after it went down, boom! And then I began to bless it like this, and I said, I speak that sounds come from this platform in this choir area from people that want to know the Lord, honor him, serve him, worship him. I said, I speak in the name of Jesus that sounds come from this platform that will reverberate through the ends of the earth. I did not know that revival was going to come to Brownsville. I did not know Lyndall Cooley was going to come here and be the choir director. I did not know he was going to go from 20 to well over 100 in the choir. I didn't know that CDs was going to be cut and it was going to go to the ends of the earth. I didn't know. But before it happened, I spoke a blessing over the choir. And God made it productive and fertile, and the choir began to just explode. Are you listening to me? So here's what happened. Then I began to go to every section of pews in the church. And Brownsville has a lot of sections over that other building. And I would go to every section on Sunday night, and I would speak a blessing, a different blessing over every section of pews. And I would just make up blessings to speak every week. And I'd say things like, I bless this choir. I mean, I bless this section of pews in the name of Jesus. For people that I've never even seen their faces, I call them in. And I said, I speak blessings over the very fabric that's on these pews that whenever they sit down here, there's going to be a DNA of the anointing of the presence of God, that whenever they sit down, they're going to be here, and the Spirit of God's going to capture their heart. They're going to hear the gospel. I bless this section of pews for every in hindrance that's in this building and every hindrance the devil would try to put in this building to keep these people from being here for the right reasons and to keep these people from hearing the gospel. I said, I bless this section of pews in Jesus' name that everybody that sits here will come to know the Lord and grow in grace. And friend, the place began to just fill up. I went to every section of the pews, went to the choir, went to every place. The church just began to fill up. So I began to see the blessings of the Lord. Now, I'm almost through with the stories and we're going to go to the scripture in a moment, so just stay with me. Then the Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to begin to serve communion in your house. I'd never heard of such a concept, and so I began to go to my house, and I'd serve my wife communion during the week, or on the weekend, she'd serve me communion, and then I would bless the house. I'd go back to the bedroom, and I'd speak blessings of peaceful rest over my bed, over our bedroom, I'd speak peace, reconciliation, et cetera, et cetera, in my bedroom. Then I'd go to the kitchen, and I would speak fellowship around the table. I'd bless the kitchen for fellowship, and I'd bless the kitchen for joy and health. I'd go to the bathrooms, and I'd speak blessings over the bathrooms for health and wholeness and wellness in Jesus' name. I'd go to the den, and I would speak that there would be sounds and peals of laughter so manifest in that house, and that the sorrow and mourning would flee away. And that joy and gladness and the oil of gladness would be poured out of the horn of, of the power and the presence of God in our den, that there would be a marked difference in the joy level of our house. 
And I began to bless every house. I began to bless the foyer that God would direct our steps, our goings out, and our comings in. Our uprisings, our down settings. I began to speak blessings. And friend, let me tell you something. Before revival ever broke out in Brownsville, it broke out in our home first. Yes. I didn't know if, if Brownsville was going to go after God in revival. I didn't know. And I wasn't going to force anything on them. But I, I began to be concerned, and I wanted to move a God. I was so desperately hungry for God. And I remember uh, me and Brenda began to call some different people in the church, and we asked them if they'd join us on Friday nights over at our house just for a time of praise and worship. And we get together on my screen and back porch at my house, and we just begin to worship the Lord back there. Some people that we knew was hungry too. And as we begin to worship, the Spirit of God would just fall on our back screen and porch. And the presence of God came down in our house before it did at Brownsville. One of the reasons why it did is because of the blessings on that house. You listening to me? Releasing the blessings on that house. And the Spirit of God just came down in an awesome way. And the first time I ever heard Lyndall Cooley prophesy, he was laying under my swing on the back porch under the presence of God. And I looked over there at him, and he was speaking and, 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 and blessing the Lord and speaking prophetically and singing prophetically, laying on that concrete floor under my swing on the back porch. And then the presence of God began to thicken and clabber in our house that whenever I'd leave to go to work, I'd leave my wife in there in the den and I'd go to work at Brownsville, and when I'd come home, there'd be a mound of tissue around her chair, and she couldn't get up all day long. Maybe to go to the bathroom, that's about it, but she sat there and wept all day long as the Spirit of God would just flood our house with the presence of God. Why? Blessing the house. I've always been a light sleeper. Always been a light sleeper. I, I just can't. I mean, it takes me forever to go to sleep, and then I can sleep about four hours and that's it, you know? And man, I can hear water dripping outside with the windows down and storm windows over the windows. I got ears, don't you say nothing. I got ears like you wouldn't believe. A light sleeper. I begin to sleep so hard, I begin to drool on my pillow. And one day I woke Brenda up, I said, Brenda! She said, what is it? I said, my God, something's wrong with me. <laughs> She said, what? I said, Brenda, something bad wrong with me. I said, I'm sleeping so hard, I'm drooling. She said, duh. <laughs> You've been blessing the bedroom with peace, remember, and sound sleep. I said, hallelujah, you're right. I said, you're right. And then I began to notice in our house just this sweet presence of God. But I'm going to make a long story real short. When revival broke out here, we lost our privacy. People began to come in from all over the world. I'd get up early in the morning, go out and get my paper, and there'd be people sitting outside flashing their lights, honking the horn, waving at me in the morning. They had nothing else to do. They wanted to see where the preacher lived. So I had to move. I mean, I lost my privacy. And the house that we lived in was a ranch-style house. It started off when we first bought it with about 1,800 square feet, and we remodeled it three times, stayed where we were in the neighborhood. We remodeled it about three times, and we took it up to like 2,100 square feet. And um, it's just an average house, 125-foot uh, lot wide and about 200 feet deep. That was it. Just an average house, eight-foot ceilings, nothing to write home about. When we put that house on the market, a lady in our church here, I don't know if she's here tonight or not, Lydia Davis. Is Lydia here? Um, when I put that house on the market, um, she said that the real estate people usually hops on a van, you know, a couple of vans and these real estate people gets on these vans, these clipboards, these pencils, and they go to all over and look at new properties. And she said, Pastor, it was the strangest thing when they came to your house. She said, these old seasoned real estate people, you know, some of them just sort of grouchy and, you know, short-tempered and ill and, you know, they just want to get in there and see it and get out of there and get back on the van and go see the next one. And she said, they pull up in front of your house and she said, Pastor, it was the strangest thing. She said they got out and stepped foot on your lawn, and she said they would say, How you doing? How's your mama doing? How's your boy doing? Is he still up at Auburn? You know, that kind of thing. Just talking and fellowshipping. And she said they came in the house, patting one another, had their arm around one another. 
She said they got in my house, and she said they didn't just stay two minutes, they didn't stay five minutes. She said they stayed close to an hour in my house. And she said they, they got in the den, and they just was happy, and they were laughing and having a good time. And she said, Pastor, when they got back to your bedroom, she said part of them was in your master bedroom and part of them was in your bathroom. She said they stayed in your master bedroom and bathroom 30 minutes. And you know what? Lydia bought my house. The real estate woman bought my house. Isn't that something? The blessings of God was on the house. And when people came under the presence of the blessings of God, you can feel the blessings of God. I want to tell you something, friend. Listen to me. There's only two kinds of environments. One is fertile. One is sterile. There's only two kinds. Your home is either fertile with the joy and the peace and the yes. presence of the Lord yes. or it's sterile yes. and it's demonized and all kinds of activities are going on there that causes people to behave in various ways. If you don't believe it, I want you to turn with me in your Bible and I'm going to have to hurry. I want to show you something powerful. Turn with me quickly to the book of Luke. Everybody turning real quick. Luke chapter 10. <laughs> I want to show you something powerful. When I saw this, it changed me in so many ways. Y'all listening? How many of you are listening? I can tell you are, man. I can tell you're listening. This is good. I know your rear end's sore, but friend, it won't be much longer now. Amen? <laughs> Just listen to me. I saw the scripture for the first time so powerfully a few years ago, and when I saw it, I'll never ever see it the same again, and I'll never ever see atmospheres the same again. Now, before we read this, look this way for a moment. Your home is either fertile or it's sterile. Your church is either fertile in its atmosphere or it's sterile. Your business is either fertile or it's sterile. If it's fertile, the blessings of the Lord is there, the joy of the Lord is there, the peace of the Lord is there, and fellowship and communion and all those things are going to be there. If your place is sterile, people's going to be hard to get along with, Kids can't hardly even eat a meal around the table with mom and dad because mom and dad's just ill with each other. And the kids don't even want to eat a meal around the table because the place is sterile. There's so many curses released. Dad criticizing mom. Mom criticizing dad. Parents criticizing the, the children. It's like monitors. They're more like monitors instead of parents. Just monitor everything. You didn't do that right. You didn't do that right. And everything is just sterile. And the kids don't even want to come and eat a meal. They can't wait to turn 18 and leave home. They're willing to join the army. They're willing to get married, do whatever they have to do to get out of that house because the place is so sterile. Come on. I've walked in places before. I've walked in mansions before, millionaires' mansions. And you walk in there and everything is beautiful. It's immaculate, marble, best of furnishings, best of decor, best of everything, landscaping. Can't wait to get out of there. Yeah. Something's not right. But I visited retirement centers with an old granny sitting there with a little bun in the back of her head and a dog-eared Bible sitting over there on a little doily on her coffee table and walk in there and sit down and you don't want to leave for several hours. What's the difference? What's the difference? One has a fertile environment of the presence of God and the other has a sterile environment. And I'm not talking about it's just with people with money either, friend. I'm talking about it can be different people on different pews Two people on the pew can have fertile homes and eight people can have sterile homes on the pews. That's true. Come on. Are you listening to me? Yes. And that makes up our churches. That's right. And I want to tell you something else. When It's just like those kids can't wait to leave home and get out of that home where the environment is sterile. Same thing is true in the church if the environment is sterile. People, when the environment is sterile, they stand up to worship and if they have to stand over five minutes, oh my God. Oh, 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 another song on the board, oh, 
oh, I hate that song. Oh, if I could just sit down. But when you go into a church where it's fertile and where the anointing is and where the presence of God is, people can stand and worship an hour and there's everybody's energized. They don't want to stop. When you're in a place where the, where the environment is sterile and the pastor's up preaching, he's only been going seven minutes and people's doing this. Oh, my Lord. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. Uh, when's he going to be through? Oh, I wonder what they got at Shoney's today. Wonder what Ryan's got on the buffet bar today, today, you know. People wondering all kinds of things. They can't stay focused. Why? Because the environment is so sterile. Why is the environment sterile? People's curse the worship leader. They curse the songs he sings. They don't like the way he dresses. They don't like the songs. They don't like the youth pastor. They don't like what's going on in the youth group. They don't like the pastor's sermons. They don't like his wife. They don't like his children. They talk about it. When they come in the church, it's just gossip here and gossip there. And the place is sterile. And I want to tell you, friend, no wonder visitors can, won't stay. Their people are not dumb. Are you listening to me? They're not dumb. They can pick up environments. Come on. Not a word has to be said. That's right. They can walk in a place and they can sense immediately, I either feel good here or I don't feel right here. That's right. Same thing is true with your business. That's right. That's right. Are you listening to me? Same thing true with your business. Your employees are miserable. Come on. And they haven't been mentored. You're their pastor. You might say, no, I'm not a credential minister. No, but you're still their boss and you're still their pastor. Yes, yes. And you can pray in that place like Tamara said she did. Play in the pray. Anoint it and start blessing the environment of that yes. business. Start blessing the room. Start blessing the employees. Yes. Anoint the pictures on their desk and start blessing their families. Come on. Yes. You know, friend, the Bible says, even when you have enemies, it says, bless your enemies. Somebody says, oh, I'll bless them. Glory to God. I'll bless them with a brick. Yeah. That's not what he's talking about. Are you listening to me? You bless your enemies. Hallelujah. Well, I, I would like to stay there, but I got to hurry. Let me show you something about environments. Now, before I read this, let me just give you a setup for the scripture. You remember when Jesus was sending out the 70 by twos? You remember that was 35 teams. He was sending out the 70 by twos. And the Bible said that he was going to send them into places where he was going to come, into cities where he was going to come. In other words, there was going to be his forerunners. So these teams were sent out ahead of him into every city where he was going to come. And the Bible says that the Lord gave them instructions before he ever sent them because, see, they couldn't go in the synagogues. They had to go in houses. And here's what he said. He said, when you go into a house, he said, first say, while you're still on the porch, in other words, before you enter the house, first say, peace be to this house. And he said, if your peace remains, in other words, when you say, peace be to this house, if your peace remains, he said, go on in. Preach the gospel of the kingdom, heal the sick, and etc. He said, but in other words, I'm just paraphrasing here, but if it flies back in your face and comes back on you, he said, don't even go in the house. You know why he said that? Don't even go in the house? Because it's going to be a futile effort. Right. The environment is not right. That's right. You listening to me? Watch this. Look at this. This is so powerful. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he's going to come. He said unto them, The harvest is great, the labors are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, and he sent forth labors in the harvest. Go your ways now. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes, salute no man by the way. Look at verse 5. In whatever house you, first, you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. If the Son of Peace is there, he said, your peace will rest on it. If not, it's going to fly back on you, going to come back on you, going to turn to you again. He said, now, if it remains in that same house, remain. Eat and drink whatever they give you. The labor is worthy of his hire. Don't go from house to house. Whatever city you first enter, they receive you. Eat such things as are set before you. Heal the sick that are therein and preach the kingdom of God has come. Now, I've got a question for you. 
If the Lord was talking about going into someone's house and he said, if your peace returns to you, don't go in there, what he's saying is, I want this place to be used for the work of my ministry. And he said, don't go in this house if you, before you enter and you say, peace be to this house, and it flies back on you. He said, don't go in there because what he knew was healings can't take place in a sterile environment. And the gospel of the kingdom can't be effective in that kind of environment. Now, I wonder how many churches Holy Spirit comes up to every Sunday. You never see him. But he walks up to the front steps of the churches all over the world each week, and he's invisible. You never see him, and you don't even hear him. But he comes up, the ushers are out in the foyer handing out bulletins, and the crowd's gathering. And it's like Holy Spirit comes in the foyer, and when somebody opens up the doors going to the sanctuary, Holy Spirit says, Peace be to this church! And it flies back in his face. And it's like he just has to turn and shake his head and walk away and say, I'll try it again later. I can't do anything here. You know why? Because they're fighting over the color of the carpet. The board hates the pastor. The pastor hates the board. The staff's in conflict with one another. Dad hates mom. Mom hates dad. The youth department's against the music department. This, that, and the other. There's so much discord in there. Holy Spirit says, peace be in this house. It flies back in his face. And he knows bodies can't be healed in that environment. He knows souls can't be saved in that environment. And he knows that pastor's going to struggle until there's a peaceful environment there, until peace is made. But pastors many times are not bold enough to speak out and say, hey, come now, let us reason together. Let's get this worked out. Come on. Many times pastors just wear blindfolds and just go on like everything's okay. Everything's not okay. In your home, if things are not right, you get your family together and you get it resolved. Are you listening to me? Yes. And in churches, the same way. And in businesses, how can you have a business with productivity, with people getting along and working and doing their thing like little ants and little bees, doing what they're supposed to be doing with the spirit of strife in the house. Everything begins to spiral downward. And it will continue to do so until you get that ferreted out. Are you listening? Yes. Remember, friend, I'm telling you, environments and atmospheres are greatly important in the kingdom of God. They're important in your house, they're important in your church, and they're important in your business. Atmospheres. Yes. Amen. Yes. I want to show you something powerful in regard to blessing. When I first started preaching on blessings and the mystery and the power of a blessing, I saw something as I just began to go through the book of, uh, the first book of the Bible. I, I could take you many places. I'm only going to just take you to two places. I want you to turn with me to Genesis 24 and verse 60. Genesis 24. <clears throat> and I want to just explain this to you before I get to it. I already gave you the verse, so you're going to try to read it now real quick. I, I know you. I can just tell. I'm going to see calyx all over the church. like. <laughs> Look this way, if you will, just for a minute. Let me, I'll get to the verse in just a minute. Let me talk to you for a minute about Israel. When I begin to go through the Bible on this thing about blessings, you see, the graduation from, from the Old Testament to the New Testament in regard to the mystery of a blessing and the power of a blessing, the Old Testament placed such a premium on the blessings of the father and the grandfather and the, the, the figures, the patriarchs and the matriarchs. There was such a premium that they placed on getting that blessing. And when you graduate over in the New Testament, is there's something that's lost, especially today, in this hour, about the power of a blessing. We've, we've lost something. Now, I want you to say this with me, please. Prayer is prayer. prayer, is prayer. Prophecy is prophecy. prophecy is prophecy. But blessing is blessing. Let me tell you what prayer is. Prayer is soliciting and petitioning God for help. Let me tell you what prophecy is. Prophecy is foretelling the future and bringing the future into the present. That's prophecy. 
Prayer is not prophecy, and prophecy is not prayer. Neither is prayer and prophecy a blessing, and neither is blessing a prophecy and prayer. There are three distinct things. A blessing is releasing out of your mouth with authority. God has put authority in your life over children, the workplace, manager, business owner, supervisor, whatever. You have authority. Grandparent, whatever. And, there, and you release out of your mouth the power of a blessing. You can release it on a person, a place, or a thing. Why do we dedicate and ordain ministers? Why do we dedicate churches? We're blessing that church. Why do we dedicate speed the light vehicles? Why do we dedicate babies? What we're doing essentially, in a nutshell, is we're blessing. That's what we're doing. We're blessing. That's right. So you can bless a person, a place, or a thing. If you've got a car that won't sell, why do you keep cursing it? You stupid car! You're the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Nobody wants you. No wonder every time I advertise you, you never sell. I don't even want you. <laughs> How many of you knows that thing's not going to sell? What you need to do is go back to the Ford. I mean, I'm sorry. You need to go back to the car, and you need to apologize. And what you need to do is revoke that and say, you know, I bless you. I don't have any need for you anymore, but I bless you that the Lord is just going to help somebody to really want you. And you'll be surprised, friend, when you start blessing that car, it'll move. Listen, the more you curse something, the worse it gets. Come on, help me out. I said, the more you curse something, the worse it gets. If you ever get thrown in the lion's den, don't go in there cursing them lions, friend. They'll eat you up. Go in there blessing them lions. Leo, whoo, I bless you in Jesus' name. You ain't hungry, Leo. You, you are a powder puff lion. I love you. I'm going to go over here now and sit down, and we're just going to talk a while. You go in there and start cursing that line, he's going to, you know, that's the way things are. The more you curse something, the worse it gets. And the more you bless something, the better it gets. Are you listening to me? Amen. Some of you's got employees. No, I'm, I'm not going to go there. Look at this. Now, don't look at the verse now. I still haven't set it up yet. Let me get it set up. You remember when Abraham sent out Eleazar to look for a bride for his son Isaac? You remember that? And the Bible says that Abraham told Eleazar, he said, now listen, I want you to go find a bride for my boy Isaac. And he said, I want you to go where I tell you to go. Made him put his hand in there and he swore. He said, I made him swear that you're going to go where I tell you to go. And you know, Eleazar on the way to find this bride for Abraham's son, he, he started praying and he said, now Lord, he said, the woman that comes out and offers me something to drink and offers my camel something to drink, he said, I'll know she's the one. So Abraham got to the well and he sat down there and come walking right out of the pages of history comes Rebecca. Walking right out of history. And she walks up to him and she says, Sir, could I get you something to drink? Now, friend, how many of you knows it's one thing to get a man something to drink, it's another thing to get camels something to drink. That was a job. And then she said this, she said, Could I get you something to drink and could I get your animal something to drink? He said, Woman, I'm paraphrasing. Woman, sit down. We need to talk. And so he told her the story. And then she said, well, you're going to have to go home and talk to my folks. So Eleazar went home with her. And the Bible says that the next morning, Eleazar told them the story. And they said, well, let the damsel abide with us about 10 days. And so he said, no, I've got to be about my master's business. I've got 10 days. He said, I'm, I'm fixing to leave here. He said, she either goes with me or she stays. But he said, you ask her. So they called the damsel, called Rebecca, and they said, will you go with this man? And she said, I'll go. And then the Bible says, as they loaded up, and she got her hand made, and they loaded up, before she went out in the yard and got up on her camel, the Bible never mentions a father. It only mentions a brother and a mother. It doesn't mention a father, but it mentions a brother and a mother. 
And before she got up on her camel, the Bible says they spoke a blessing on Rebecca, and it was a 24-word blessing. I want you to listen to me. Whenever you start cursing something, you'll be surprised how it just rolls out. It just comes in paragraphs and pages. You just start cursing something. <laughs> but a blessing is so powerful, just a few words is awesome. And here's what the Bible says. It says that they called her out. And you look in your Bible, verse 60. Here's what they said to Rebecca. They said, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let your seed possess the gate of those which hate them. You know what? That's a 24-word blessing. Everybody look this way for a minute. That's a 24-word blessing. Don't count them. I've counted them many times. It's a 24-word blessing. They spoke a 24-word blessing over that girl that lasts till this day. I want to tell you something, friend. Who was Rebecca? She was going to become the wife of Isaac. Isaac and Rebecca was going to give birth to twins called Esau and Jacob. Jacob was going to have his name changed to Israel. And Jacob was going to have 12 sons, and that was going to become the 12 tribes of Israel. So when they were out in the front yard blessing Rebecca, they didn't realize it, but that 24-word blessing holds to this day. Israel is surrounded by enemies on every side. The Arabs are all around them. Saddam Hussein has aimed his missiles at them. Yasser Arafat hates their guts. There's millions of Arabs around them. But the Bible said, let your seed possess the gate of those that hate them. And they can't destroy Israel to this day. Why? Because somebody released a blessing out of their mouth over that girl. If that was powerful then and is still holding today, think what you can do with your children and your grandchildren. Woo, I feel that. Think what you can do. Instead of bellyaching and griping, Instead of cursing your family, cursing your, your children, cursing your house, cursing your business, cursing your partners. Wow. Watch this. <laughs> Ruth and Boaz goes to get married. And whenever I saw this, God just let me keep keep taking blessings to other levels. First of all, it started with a stupid orchestra pit. I mean the blessed orchestra pit. <laughs> now, I, did that, I did that on purpose so you'd catch it. The blessed orchestra pit. Anyway, listen. It started off there, and then it went to blessing my children. Then it went to blessing the church sections of pews. Then it went to blessing my home. Then it went to other areas and God was beginning to show me some things about the mystery and the power of a blessing. Now, I'm not talking about you getting blessings. I'm talking about you giving blessings. Giving them out as a federal headship over people that God's put you over. You listening to me? So now the Lord said, I wanted to go to another level. The Lord said, I don't want there to never be another wedding in Brownsville without the bride being blessed and the groom being blessed. And so... I said, okay. So I told the, the couple that I was going to marry, I said, now, you know, honey, your daddy's going to have to bless you at your wedding. Oh, Brother Kilpatrick, my Lord, he'll faint. He's nervous about even putting on a tuxedo. And he can't say anything. He's never spoken in public. And my daddy don't even go to church. I said, yeah, but he's going to bless you. Oh, Brother Kilpatrick, he can't. I said, he's got three options. I said, he can either speak it out of his heart, lift your veil and bless you and lay his hand on you, bless you, his federal headship over your life. Or either, if he can't bless you and think of something to say, he gets nervous, I'm going to have him write it down and he'll read it off. And if he can't read it off, I'm going to let him ride down, the truck in his, ride down the road in his pickup truck. And I'm going to let him record it on a cassette tape. And he'll lift your veil of the wedding and we'll put the tape in and we'll play his voice. But he's going to bless you whether he likes it or not. And she said, oh, this is going to be bad. He won't do it. And you know what? He did it. And whenever he blessed her, as soon as he raised his hand to bless her, 
He wasn't even a church member. Listen, friend, I make the sinners bless their, their kids as well as the Christians bless their kids. Because, listen, a sinner can curse his kid. He can sure bless his kid. You listening to me? And if there's no father, I let the grandfather do it. If there's no grandfather, I let an uncle do it. If there's no uncle, I let the mother do it. If there's no mother, I let the brother do it. If the brother's not there, I do it. I've spoken many blessings over weddings. And <laughs> I have seen some stuff. Oh, let me just tell you how it normally goes. I said, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Her mother and I. I said, ladies and gentlemen, the father of the bride now is coming to speak a blessing over his daughter. So many kids have been cursed all their life. You know, so many kids, especially back in my time, eloped. And they'd run off to Mississippi and get married, run off to Alabama and get married, you know. They'd elope because mama hated the boy she was going to marry or daddy hated the girl his, his, his son was going to marry. And, and they, they knew they could never get their parents' approval, so they'd elope. And then one day she starts showing. And the daddy says, girl, come here. Are you pregnant? Yeah, daddy. I'll kill him. No, daddy, no, no. He's my husband. We got married eight months ago. What? I knew I could never get your blessing, daddy, so we eloped. We've been married for eight months. I just didn't want to tell you. I was afraid to tell you. That's the way it used to be. That's the way it used to be. There's people sitting in pews in churches all over this nation that has never had their blessings of their dad and their mom and their parents, grandparents, never had the blessings. And you know what? You may be successful. You hear me. You may be successful. And you may be making money. But man, there's something in you that's aching. And every once in a while, hot tears will run down your face and your lip will be in the quiver. Because something is, is hurting in you where you've never really got that kiss and that blessing from your folks. And it's painful. There's so many people that I have met in the ministry that's handicapped. They're literally handicapped because they've been cursed all their life and they never got a blessing. And when I preach on this whenever I travel or here at Brownsville, whatever I preach on the television, the mail will come. And people will come by the hordes. Brother Kilpatrick, would you bless me? Would you bless me? And I do. But let me just go on. Let me tell you what happened. The Bible says when Ruth and Boaz got married, I won't take time to turn there because I've gone too long already. Y'all give me a few more minutes? I'm going to take it anyway. <laughs> Ruth and Boaz got married. And the Bible says whenever Ruth, the kinsman redeemer, came out to, to take uh, Ruth is his wife. Boaz took Ruth as his wife in the congregation at the gates of the city. The Bible says that the congregation blessed Ruth and Boaz. And they spoke a blessing over Boaz and Ruth. And when they spoke the blessing over her, they said, Be thou famous in Bethlehem. And did you know that Ruth was the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ? Where was Jesus born? He was born in Bethlehem. They spoke a blessing long time before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. A blessing. A blessing. Yes. Release it out of the mouth. Just release it out of the spirit. It's a blessing. You listening? Yes. So, usually at Brownsville, I say, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Her mother and I. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, the father of the bride is going to speak a blessing over his daughter and he'll raise the veil. You know, usually it's Christians. And he'll raise the veil and he'll lay his hand on her and he'll begin to bless his daughter. And he'll say things like this, sweetheart, we love you so much. You've always been such a pleasure to raise. And sweetheart, I just give you my blessing on this marriage today. We received this young man into our home and into our arms and our hearts and our family. And I speak over you that God bless your womb and anoint you to have healthy children. And we're going to be such a happy family with grandchildren. And I bless you to be the queen of your home, and I bless you for God to anoint you with health the days of your life. And, you know, tears just start streaming down, man. Many times, that's the first time that bride ever got her daddy's blessing. Oh, how easy it is to curse. But how we get locked, jaw when it comes time to bless. So awkward for men especially. Come here, son. Let me bless you. Men can't do that. They just can't, you know, their business. So. Got to be a man, boy. I want you to be a strong man. Yeah. Why don't you bless him to be a strong man? Come on, come on. You see what I'm saying? Anyway, I got to hurry. And then the father of the groom will bless his son in a similar way. But I remember one time I had a wedding. 
And this sweet little girl was getting married in the church, and she was a petite little thing, you know. Precious girl, beautiful. Real feminine. And she's getting married, and she's marrying Bubba. <laughs> Bubba is Bubba personified. You know, you know what a Bubba is, don't you? I mean, they're everywhere. And, and he's a wonderful guy, but he's a Bubba. He's, he's country. He's backwoodsy. She's this little feminine thing, you know, real petite little thing, but she loves Bubba. <laughs> so he's coming down the aisle, and he's got on his tuxedo, and he's got on roach-killing cowboy boots. <laughs> and they come down, and I say, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And the daddy says, her mother and I. And I said, the daddy's going to speak a blessing over his daughter. And he touches that little petite girl, you know, and speak this precious blessing over her. And then after he gets through, you know, the tears are rolling. People in church are sniffing and crying. And then I say, now, ladies and gentlemen, the father of the groom is coming to bless his son. And friend, <laughs> Bubba of all Bubba stands up. <laughs> if you thought Bubba looked like Bubba, this was the Bubba of all Bubbas. He was the poster boy for Bubba. Never been in church a day in his life. Crude and rude. And he stands up and he grabs a microphone. And he walks up there to him and he says, Boy, I bless you. You hear what I'm saying to you, boy? You're going to be blessed whether you like it or not. And I'll tell you something else too, boy. You're going to get a job and you're going to hold that job because I sure ain't going to support you. And I'll tell you something else right now, boy. You're going to have a mess full of your house full of young'uns. There's going to be a mess of young'uns, and you're going to make a mine, because I sure ain't going to have no brats for a bunch of young'uns. I ain't going to raise no grandkids in my house. It's a bunch of bratty young'uns. And I'll tell you something else. You're going to get a good job that pays you good money. You're going to make a good living for that family. You understand what I'm saying to you, boy? Now, you be blessed. You hear what I'm saying to you today? <laughs> And he goes over, lays the microphone down, and sits down like, all right, preacher, it's yours now. <laughs> Friend, <clears throat> I'm usually composed. <laughs> Listen, I'm usually composed in those kind of situations. <laughs> but I, the congregation at Brownsville was sitting there like this. Their, their face was like mine. It was like ice, but their bodies was doing this. <laughs> their faces was just... And I was in such pain, my face, my face never changed. I had that ministerial wind and dignity on me, you know, glory to God. <laughs> but my body, I said, Jesus, you're going to have to help me. You hear what I'm saying to you, Jesus, Holy Spirit. If you've ever helped me, you're going to have to help me now. <laughs> and so I was standing behind the podium, and I did this right here. I took the heel of my shoe, and I stood on my toe to cause pain. I was able to move on because I was in pain. I got my mind off of Bubba, and I got my mind on that. But you know what? It took my mind off of it. Whenever I got my composure, and I looked back at Bubba, tears running down his face. Everybody in the house was cracked up, laughing out of their gourds. Bubba had tears running down his face. It was the first time in his life Anybody ever blessed him? And he was standing there in that tuxedo so proud. And his daddy made a literal fool out of himself. But Bubba was blessed. I'm closing. This is my last story. I promise. I bless you. I bless you. I'm before time. Ward told me to go until they held the cue card up. And Ward knows. No. Anyway. 
Let me close with this. I, I promise this is the last thing I'm going to tell you. When I got through preaching this series at Brownsville on the mystery and power of blessing, on a Sunday night before revival broke out, of course, I would preached, I, I guess it was about eight, ten parts, and I chose the best five. And whenever I uh, got through preaching it, I was at church, and the service was about to begin on Sunday evening. A young man came up to me after the, before the service, and I'd seen him around Brownsville for years, Richard. He was a young person. <laughs> he was real hefty. He was real overweight. He always had a shirt tail hanging out, and his hair never was groomed. He just had no personal hygiene much at all about him. And he was one of those type of people, when you see him, you know, in the youth group, he just sort of always looked alone and looked lonely. And his name was Michael. And he came up on the platform, and he said, Pastor, you got just a second? I said, hey, buddy. I said, man, I've been seeing you around here a long time. I said, get yourself up here and talk to me. What's going on with you? He said, Brother Kilpatrick, I just can't tell you what a difference your sermons have made in my life on the mystery and power of a blessing. I said, well, son, thank you. He said, oh, no. He said, thank you. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, let me, let me just tell you a quick story. He said, Brother Kilpatrick, he said, I was raised in pure hell. He, he never mentioned his mother. He only mentioned his daddy. I don't know if his mother was dead or what. <clears throat> but he said, Brother Kilpatrick, he said, my father was a mean man. He was a rough man, a real strong man, no love, never, never would praise you. Never would, no intimacy, you know, never no kindness, just always so mean. And he said, um, when I got through hearing you preach on the mystery and power of a blessing, he said, I really realized I needed my daddy's blessing in my life. He said, so I drove, drove my old car up to Ohio, back to the house where I was raised, and my dad's still there. And he said, I... Hadn't seen my dad in four years. He said, I went up. He said, I was afraid to knock on the door. And he said, I knocked on the door. And he said, my dad came to the door and opened up the door. I hadn't seen him in four years. And he said, what do you want? He said, uh, uh, <coughs> Dad, uh, I, uh, I, I just come home and I wanted to ask you if you'd do something for me. Didn't I tell you when you left home, don't you ever come back to me? Didn't I tell you when you left home, you've always been a deadbeat. That's all you'll ever be. Didn't I tell you that? And didn't I tell you when you get out there and find out what the real world's all about, don't come crawling to me because I'm not going to help you. You're lazy. You've always been lazy. I've always been ashamed of you. And now here you come, just like I told you. Right? And he said, Dad, no. He said, uh, he said, uh, he said Dad, I'm a Christian now. And he said, I'm going to church in Pensacola, to a church down there in Pensacola, Florida. And he said, I've been there for several years. And he said, I gave my heart to the Lord. And he said, I'm doing good. And he said, uh, my pastor just got through preaching a series about how important your, your, your daddy is in your life, your, your, your parents are in your life. And he said, Daddy, he said, I, I've come home and I want to ask you to do something for me. It won't cost you a penny. He said, I want to ask you would, you, would you be willing to maybe speak some good words over me because I need them real bad. I'm handicapped in my life. I don't like what I see in the mirror. I go on a job interview and I start hyperventilating and I get embarrassed and I have to leave the office. I can't talk. My heart's beating so strong I, can't even, I don't have no confidence. And he said, Dad, I, 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 just, I, eat, I just eat all the time. I don't feel good about myself. I can't get a job. I have to throw papers. I have to do something where I don't have to be around people because I feel like people just don't like me. And he said, Dad, I really need you to say some good words over me because I'm handicapped. And he said, my pastor's been preaching about the mystery and power of a blessing. And he said, Dad, I really realize how important you are in my life. You're the federal headship of my life. You're my daddy. You're not just my biological father, but you're my covering. And I need you to say something good over me so bad. And he said, here's what I'd like to ask you to do. He said, just, just, just listen to me, if you will, just for a minute. He said, I'd like to go back to my bedroom, and I'd like to pull up a chair, 
and you don't even have to look at me. I'll face the wall. And he said, I'll, I'll just like to pull up a chair and face the wall. And he said, if you could just sort of take your time and walk through the house and just maybe think of a few good things, just a few good words you'd like to say over me. And he said, I'll just sit there in the chair and wait till you come in. And he said, whenever you walk into the room, he said, you don't have to look at me or nothing, but he said, if you could just come, maybe lay your hand on my shoulder or just touch me on the head or something and just say those few good words. He said, I'll be up out of the chair and I'll be back in my car and I'll be on the way to Pensacola. He said, that's all I've come for. I don't, I don't need no money or nothing. I, God's blessed me so far. I'm doing pretty good, I, but I do need you, Daddy. He said his daddy got real quiet and didn't agree or disagree. So the boy said he went back there and pulled up a chair and faced the wall in his bedroom. And he said when he pulled up the chair, he said he heard his daddy start pacing. They had a floor furnace. And he said he walked over that floor furnace. He don't know how many times. Up and down that hall. He said he think he's going to turn in that bedroom. He keep going on down the other end of the house, pace back past the bedroom, down the other end of the house. He said he must have done that I don't know how many times. Isn't that strange, friend? Just ask a man to try to think of a few good words to say over you, and he just got a lockjaw. He can't say anything. But when it comes to cursing, just vomits it out. Y'all really realize what a cursed-filled world we live in? Y'all listening to me? And he said, finally, Brother Kilpatrick, finally. He said, my dad walked in that room. He said, it was so quiet in the house. He said, I heard him when he walked up behind me. He said, my heart started beating. And he said, he stood behind me. And he said, he didn't touch me, but he just walked right up behind me. He said, the first thing I felt from my daddy was he said, water was dripping down my neck. He said, my daddy was crying. And he said, some of it would splatter on my skin and some of it splatter on my shirt. And he said, man, I was listening so close. He said, I couldn't believe my daddy was crying. And then he said, Brother Kilpatrick, it seemed like an eternity. And I heard his lips part. His lips were dry. And he said, I heard his lips part. And he said, I felt a hand come on my shoulder on the back part of my shoulder like this. And he said, when my dad's lips parted, he said, I heard him say these words. Son, I am so sorry. He said, Brother Kilpatrick, the pores of my soul literally opened up. And he said, I heard my dad say, I'm so sorry. And then he said the words I've been waiting to hear all my life. He said, I heard my daddy say, son, I really do love you. And then he said, Brother Kilpatrick, he said, he started to bless me. And he said, when he started to bless me, he said, the Holy Ghost hit him. And he sounded like a Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> he said, oh, son, oh, bless you. Woo. I bless you, boy. Oh, bless you, son, to do good in life. You ain't going to be handicapped no more. Your daddy's going to speak good words over you. You ain't going to have no more of that trouble when you go in for job interviews. I bless you, son. You're a fine young man, as fine as anybody else. And I bless you. And he said, oh, Brother Kilpatrick, he started blessing me. And he said, he started preaching, man. I'm, he just started walking back and forth preaching. Just laying hands all over me. And he said, the pores of my soul opened up. And I looked at him on the platform and I said, son, what's your name? He said, Michael. I said, Michael, you lost some weight. He said, mm-hmm. I said, you lost a good bit of weight. And I looked and the shirt tail was tucked in. I looked up there and the hair was combed. I looked down there at the end of the pew and I said, who's that down there? He said, I said, who's that little girl down there? He said, it's my girlfriend. 
I said, is that the first? He said, it's the first one I ever had. And he said, I just come up here and ask you to pray for me. He said, because I'm going on my first job interview tomorrow. And he said, I can't wait. I said, why? He said, because now the confidence of the Lord is all over me. Are you listening to me? I'm going to close. I promise. I promise. I promise this is it. Then the Lord spoke to my heart. And God began to show me that the people in churches, not counting the world, but let's just talk about church for a minute. Let's don't even talk about business. Let's just talk about church for a minute. How many people sitting in pews in churches all over America of all denominations and non-denominations are sitting there and they're saved on their way to heaven, washed in the blood, but there's a gaping hole in them where they've never had a blessing. And you know what? When that young man told me that story, I smiled with him. And when we walked away, sadness hit me. Because I was the one that preached the series. But my daddy died in 1985. My daddy left us when I was 12. He left us over church. He left us over my mother becoming a Pentecostal tongue-talking Christian. He didn't want a Christian wife, and he certainly didn't want a Pentecostal Christian wife. And he left us over church. He left us when I was 12, and we had it extremely difficult, extremely difficult, extremely difficult. You'll never know. My mother had three nervous breakdowns. And my father, when I called him and told him I was called to preach at the age of 14, my daddy's words to me were, I'd rather see you dead than with a Bible under your arm. You gonna be one of them Pentecostal preachers? I said, Daddy, I didn't call to offend you. I said, I just was calling you to tell you that the Lord's called me to preach. Well, don't be calling me and telling me that stuff. That turns me off. It makes me sick. I'd rather see you dead than with a Bible under your arm. And I tried to have a relationship with him, especially after my grandkids came, because I needed my father. As difficult as it was, I needed him. And I needed him to hold my grandchildren. I needed to see him hold my grandchildren. I needed his approval. And I remember I went to see him. He was in the last stages of cancer. When I walked in the room, when I went to see him, he was at a house in North Georgia. He would already turned blue. And I called an ambulance and rushed him to the hospital. And when they revived him, I didn't know he had a phobia of hospitals and needles and blood and all that stuff. I didn't know it. And whenever they resuscitated him, I was standing outside the emergency room there, the little curtain, and I heard him rear up on his elbow, and he screamed out, How did I get here? And I stuck my head through the curtain, and I said, Daddy, I said, I, I had you brought here. I said, you was already turning blue. You was dying. And I said, I brought you here to get you some help. And my daddy leaned up on his elbow, and I'll never forget it. His last words to me, he cursed me, as he'd done many times. I was pastoring Brownsville. Had two children, my wife. He knew us all. He pointed his finger at me, and he said, Don't you ever come to see me again. You get back down there in Pensacola. Don't you ever see me again. I hate you. And he started cursing me, cussing me and cursing me. And when that young man walked off the platform, It broke my heart that he, he was able to get his daddy's blessing, but mine was gone. I could never get it. But I want to tell you the good news. If somebody in your life is dead that was your father, your stepfather, or somebody important like that, and you didn't get their blessing and they're dead, I want to tell you, there's other authority figures that God has put in your life that it works just as well. Before my pastor died, I was at Brownsville here one Tuesday, and the Lord spoke to me and said, go see pastor. I drove up to see him on Tuesday. He was just fine, 88 years old. Before I pulled out of the driveway that day, I stood in his front yard, and I said, Brother Wetzel, would you do me a favor? I said, would you lay your hand right here? And I said, would you speak a blessing over me? And he took that little old fat hand of his. 
He built many churches, pioneered many churches, built the churches, sawed the wood. It was a different day back then. He was a frontier pioneer preacher. He laid that hand right there. And whenever he started blessing me, I felt the pores of my soul open. And I felt that blessing come on me. I'll tell you what we're going to do tonight as we end the service. We're going to practice blessing. I wish, like everything, your children could be here so you could bless them. It's Easter. Many families will get together for Easter. How great it would be if you can get together with your family and call your children in and say, you know, son, I've failed you in a lot of different ways. You know, daughter, daddy tried to be as good as he could be, but I know I've failed you in a lot of different ways, and I know I've spoken things over you that I regret. I'd like to revoke those things. And I wonder, would you give me the honor and would you give me the privilege of blessing you? Holidays are a great time for that. And don't be super spiritual about it because it'll turn them off. You know, don't be super spiritual like, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm your father and I'm going to speak this. Don't do that. Go to them humbly. And you know what? You'll find out whenever you lay your hand on them like I laid my hand on my children, like I laid my hand on the house, and like I laid my hand on the orchestra pit. When I raise my hands like a priest, something began to crackle in the environment. There's a mystery and there's a power to a blessing that I don't think the modern day church has ever tapped into. Here's what I want to do. We're going to close the service out tonight by blessing. And we're going to practice. Now, say this with me again. Prayer is prayer. prayer, is prayer. Prophecy is prophecy. prophecy. Do it again. Now, whenever it comes time to bless, it's not time to pray. And I don't want to see anybody say, Jesus, oh, Lord, who bless them, Lord. No, that's not blessing. That's praying. That's a cop out. If I see anybody close your eyes and lay hands on somebody and start praying, I'm going to come back here and slap you, friend. We ain't going to be doing no praying tonight. You understand what I'm saying? I want you to open up your eyes, and I want you to bless your wife with your eyes open and with your hand on her head or on her shoulder or whatever. I want you to bless your wife. I want you to bless your husband. I want, to, I want you to bless your children. If you don't have any family here and there's no children here, there's no husband here, no wife here, I want you to find another single that's here, a male with a male and a female with a female, and I want you to begin to practice before you go home and do it with your wife, your children, or go back home wherever that may be. I want you to start this thing of blessing. I want you to start releasing blessings out of your mouth. And I want to tell you, you'll be amazed at the power there is and the mystery that there is in a blessing. I've prayed about things for years, and God's blessed me through prayer. But I've never seen such productiveness as I have when I started blessing. There's a mystery to it, and there's a power to it. One more thing. When I started blessing the, the people here at Brownsville, the Lord said, I want you to stop praying over the tithes and the offerings, and I want you to start blessing the tither. And so on Sundays now, I have the tithers stand up and hold their tithe and offerings up. And when they stand up in church and hold their tithes and offerings up, that tithe and offering is lifted up in the air like a lightning rod. And when they stand up and lift it up, I stand up like a priest before the congregation, the covering of this church, and I release a blessing out of my mouth over the tithers and those giving offerings. Whether they have it with them or whether they don't, if they get paid once a month, once every other week, or once a week, if they're here and they hold their ties up, they hold their hand up if they don't have it with them, but I bless them. And from the time I started blessing the tithers of Brownsville, miracles begin to break out immediately, immediately, and reports and testimonies begin to flood in unlike anything we've ever done in the history of the church. Amen. And the giving jumps substantially by the, tens of hundreds, by the tens of thousands of dollars a week. The giving jumps. And blessings and the testimonies begin to roll in. Say it with me again. And here's the bottom line. Whenever you begin to bless, you're releasing something 
You're speaking it over your child, you're speaking it over your wife, you're speaking it over the ties, you're speaking it at a marriage, you're speaking it over your home. Whatever you're doing, you're releasing something and God comes and kisses it and all of a sudden, fertility just erupts. You'll see a difference immediately. So before I call you forward, let me say this to you business people. Anointed for business, one of the greatest things you can do, take it from me, I learned it the hard way. God had to teach it to me. That's why I'm teaching it to you tonight. Take it from me. Listen to me. Stop cursing your employees. Stop cursing your productivity. Stop cursing where you are. Stop cursing what's going on. And walk in there, lift your hands up, and start releasing a blessing on the Lord. You'll see things begin to change in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? You know what I want to do? Wow. I feel this. Woo, I feel this. Matter of fact, I'm going to come out there and pray for you, too.